giant woodcut um, by a German artist called Christiana Baumgart. Do you want to see if it goes? Yeah, yeah. Amazing though this is. Um, it's, uh, to give you an idea how big the woodcut is, it's, uh, that's me standing with my head in front of it, so, uh... Well, sadly, it's very pixelated. Ah, so uh, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, you should all have to come around and... and photograph. Yes, it, rather than you buy a ticket, that's really draconian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll sort of over here, so we can still see him. So, so you can see be seen, right? Everybody can see, and you can hear, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Yes, and then you're all Mattia has a God complex today. Uh, has mentioned God at least every time we've talked, and today he's just uh, said that you have a God complex that you can now live. Yeah, because you can be this omnipotent thing. <laughs> yeah, seeing eye. They all seeing eye. And you're going to be able to stir that around. I've already jumbled it up. It needs to be stirred. Can we have your pen? Yeah. Here. We'll stir. Yeah, try not to get the ink on it. Maybe upside down. We don't want the top come off. No. Okay, what happens when you mix, you ask philosophers and artists to do something like this? <laughs> It looks great aesthetically. <laughs> okay, good. That's, that's probably just going to have to be how it is. Thank you. Okay, so if you put the top back on. Now. Yeah. Okay, now if you put your hand underneath it. No, turn it around. Oh, no, 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 in the front. Front, front, front. The other way. No, no. The other way. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's automatic. Yes. A, a fun one. Well, we'll make it a little bigger, okay? Put your hand in it. Take it out. Now put it back in. Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh. okay. <laughs> See, these are the toys that my, parent, my, my family sends me. Okay, so you can pass that around and we can have some nuts. Okay. Um, right. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, there should be more coming out. Maybe that will be. They do, yes. You didn't let the paper on this. No, we don't, because it's not to be opened up. Did anything come up? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, now, what I'd like to do is, uh, if everybody could uh, once again go around the room and say who you are, what you are, so that we can um, try and be serious about this. Um, that would be fantastic. So, go ahead. Oh, hi, Sam. Um, yeah. My name is Mattia. I'm a PhD student. And um, I will not repeat what I always say because it has become a bit of a stereotype. Um, I have a curiosity and I'm intrigued about the frontier between heterogeneity and uh, order, which I think is an artistic moment. And I am looking at it also, not only, also using complexity theory because it analyzes this directly. So the frontier between heterogeneity and order. So are you suggesting that they are linked, that they are like on the one side of the no, there are two sides. That's precisely what the interest So what's the frontier? The frontier is a frontier on nothing. Not nothing that's <laughs> important, but is on one side there's been our time. Okay. And is the is the difference or the passage between cars and order. So it's a constant reassembling of the same into the new distributions. Okay. Um, and you want to give the example of the MIT thing that you were saying today at lunch? The little drone Brain. Oh, that's a, well, I don't know how directly it applies, but apparently there is a new uh, um, non material drone, it's a bot that can crawl the web and gather all the possible information about somebody across any platform uh, and then assemble them, creating a perfect map uh, of what you do in space and time. And not only to see what you've done, but also predict what you're going to do. So, why would that be called a drone? 
I thought it would, could be called a drone because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a software that does it. It's not, there isn't a person that literally goes around and collects information. The software that puts everything together and creates the map. And then there is a person who does the analysis. But, um, but is, would you say that that would be a good example? Could, could that be an example of the frontier between heterogeneity and order? And do you realize you're becoming a rapid reaction? <laughs> Um, can you hear us, Pat Uh yeah, I can. It's not a question of the the, the volume, but the um, uh, the compression the compression coding is uh, affecting the sound, which makes it it makes it very difficult to um, to distinguish the words the words you're saying. But uh, okay, I'll, so I'm going to struggle on. Like, there's, there's nothing you can do about it by moving a microphone yes. or anything like that, so <laughs> sure. it's uh, just my problem here. Okay, but so when I said could you hear, I meant could you actually understand the words? <laughs> Not uh, really. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right, well, we'll try again. Um, uh, go. Oh, we, we were talking about, uh, Matthias was introducing himself saying, <laughs> saying <laughs> you got to shake it a little bit. Yeah, and the top has come off. Yeah. The top has come off. Um, okay. 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 This was a bad idea. I can say this. Um, uh, Matthias was saying that his work is uh, trying to understand the relation between heterogeneity, the frontier of heterogeneity, and chaos. Then the example was raised about the new drone that MIT has come up, the new bot drone that can go crawl the web and, and assemble all aspects of anyone's data through through any dimension of space and time and create a pattern of one's life and therefore be able to to be an element where one can get hit uh, if need be. And so I asked uh, Mattia whether or not that would be an example of the frontier between heterogeneity and, um, and order and chaos. And um, Claire? Yes, yes, I could hear everything. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. OK, we'll just let, leave it there. OK, John Paolo. Uh, yeah, my name is John Paolo. And can you hear him? Yes. OK. Um, it was only you that was mumbling. <laughs> Yeah. I'm still thinking about um, right, a, a small part of what I uh, would like to do is uh, look at the um, shamanic uh, process, but kind of between two two different sort of um, realizations of it. On the one hand, um, through Michael Tussik. Oh, right, okay. Um, and this is kind of, a, through him, it's a sort of discussion that would bring in things like uh, um, critical theory and so relationship to Benjamin and, and, and Adorno, things like that. But, but really, that's sort of a, a, around the shamanic process being something about um, turning, turning a trick on reality. So it's a kind of a, a split this. Um, Looking at this thing between the unknown and reality, and using a sort of a, a tricking, since reality is a trick, to so sort of trick reality itself. Do you know um, the work of Gene Fisher on the trickster? Um, no, but that would sort of that's, fit that's into that side. Exactly what she does. Yeah. And also the artist Jimmy Duran. Do you know his work? Um, He's a first yeah. principles person. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy. He does a lot of stuff on shamanism. Yeah. Um, but then on the other uh, <coughs> sort of And then, so so that also brings in um, the the myth the methodology of uh, Fichte criticism, um, and therefore. Did you say the methodology of Fichte's criticism? Fichte criticism. What's Fichte criticism? Uh, well, I think the way Tussik speaks about it, he, he sort of relates to it as uh, having stemmed from um, some sort of feminist writings from Australia of the seventies, but really it's kind of a, a cut up. Uh, approach, um, sort of thinking of burrows and yeah. things like that, whereby um, really the the the, um, the way you relate to, to knowledge is not uh, in terms of looking for the meaning, but kind of the experience of of knowledge, and and then um, it's it's about having that experience within a constellation of lots of other. Uh, uh, Things and then there's kind of an emergent or an emerging um, work that comes through that. 
and so it's kind of allowing that to talk back or something like that. So this is that's the one side. But then the other side is is uh, the shamanistic philosophy as kind of we've interpreted the the sort of um, the Native American philosophy, which kind of is is more about the sort of uh, in our interpretation about the well-being of, of um, that's how we see it. So it's not really about the perhaps the tricking, but more about sort of an honest um, standing or, or an, uh, um, you're not going to say an authenticity or No, well, I, I don't know if that is going to come into it, but um, about some sort of um, humbleness, hmm. which would, I don't know, you know, what, what, how that sort of kind of, what that does to all that other thing about hmm. well, I mean, just Just a couple things. One is that be very careful about this thing called the Native American yeah. X, yeah. because there's about 20 tribes yeah. that are involved, and there's very different, you know, um, yeah. posi positions. But I guess a commonality is the non-possession of land, and the way in which different um, land animal environments retain a certain spiritual environment, so that one ha not only does one not have a right to have this level of, of uh, immodesty, mm -hmm. but there's no room, li literally no room for modest or immodest. There would, there would be no mm -hmm. term like that. And I would recommend that you actually learn one of the languages, Cherokee or Sioux. Mm -hmm. Literally study the language because it'll tell you a lot okay. in that. The shamanism. Ojibwe is very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. 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 My name is Tamiba. Um, my fish report for Buzz is under construction. <laughs> it's still under construction, huh? Okay. So you don't want to say anything more? No. Okay. And you're not allowed to say what you always say. Okay. You can't say that. You have to come up with something completely right. different. Okay. Um, I'm Dave, and my research probably focuses on um, looking at it, um, how things sort of come together, primarily in binary in zeros and ones, and how they sort of differ, how they operate rather instead of a, a dialectically zero and one, how they sort of interact, stick together, make make strings out of them, build concepts out of them, and sort of what the sort of difference is between one and the other. Hmm. Looking at um, partic uh, particularly in digital environments, through the web, one of the main arenas where it, that sort of comes into play. Um, and through my own art practice, I deal with sort of ideas of simultaneity, working across the same ideas or expressions through different mediums in the same setting. So they sort of pick apart each other, they, and they interact in a way that's sort of not zero and one. Do you have uh, any relationship to music? Do you compose at all? Or do you have any of that? I do play piano and drums, but. Uh, would, would there be any thinking around how zero one may enter <coughs> enter at the level of uh, some kind of uh, musical composition? Would you have any? Would you th be thinking in that way at all? Um, I'm, a I'm asking this because we have a PhD student right now who couldn't be here uh, because Ben because he's finishing and he's in that that psychotic phase. Um, who is a composer, and his work it deals with literally how the zero and ones operate uh, in terms of software op uh, obsolescence, and how uh, you create different musical environments, and then you can't play them because the software is dead uh, or something else. And in fact, you know the guy from Stein that we had mm -hmm. in Greenwich. Um, uh, what is his name? Uh, Nick. No. Yeah, um, Takuro. Takuro Ishima. Oh, no, no. Um, uh, his work is very similar to that. You might want to take a look at some of that. It might be interesting for you. It just take you in a totally different view, but back around from sort of another side to your work. Oh, interesting. Good. Uh, <coughs> I'm Mark, and uh, this week I mainly be a musician, I do believe, because my head's full of keys. Um, but, um, the rest because of your time, head is what? Full of keys. Oh, good, yeah, okay. Keys. Yeah. I appreciated uh, the links that you sent around. Your your video your YouTube stuff. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. 
So you live in hope about what about the music? You know, do it. Like it every day, you know, mm. more often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was, uh, that was always my plan. I thought it was interesting last week when we were talking about names. And, yeah. You know, a name that wasn't named that you had uh, in the music s scenario versus the name that you have here. And I was thinking that it takes, for me, it took a long time for me to bring anything that was around sexual politics into the university uh, because it meant so much to me mm. and I didn't want it to be uh, under the eye of being graded or being put on the CV. So I was very opposed to women's studies, you imagine queer studies, any of this kind of stuff, I was just like, no. Uh, and as a result, um, <coughs> there was really two different people that were growing up and that's one of the reasons that I did go for, the, I opted for the Johnny thing because I thought to myself, you know, I wanted to make the crossover. I wanted to make the academic world admit that they got things off the street. And I wanted the street to admit that they got things from the university. And that's what I started playing with the name. Now, whether or not it's worked, it's made me very quite psychotic, but I mean, but I'm wondering if that had happened to you. I mean, if you have these kind of, you know, when you want these things to come into different uh, arenas, and then you get confused which arena they're in in a certain sense. Suddenly, yeah. you start being really like the hardcore philosopher in a kind of like nightclub, <laughs> you know, or you start being like the crazy, you know, um, sex person, in my case, you know, in this, you know, and so there's all these mix-ups that happen, and I find that sometimes that's good, and sometimes the accidents produce very interesting uh, results, and sometimes they are disastrous. Yeah, I've been wondering, I thought for the last decade plus, I've been structuring my life, so it's been get up, you know, it's like work life. Reading all day, you know, reading, writing all day, mm -hmm. so that kind of thing. And then in the evening, the music starts, and then it's, you put that down and pick this up and carry on doing that all evening. And what happened if I, that it used to be, I put the music back at the front and woke up in the morning and got on with that just mm -hmm. to try that out. And, yeah. And then in the evening, maybe just, just, just thinking about changing it around to kind of like what it was before when it, you know, it first started, it was like music and then writing. Change your life around, change the structure around how you do things. Because it's very ritualistic, my kind of life. You know, it's work, coffee, work, lunch, work, tea, work, dinner, and then it's music. It's always like this day in, day out. So you can maybe change the structure. One of the things I found is that the kind of thing I hope we're doing here is what I'm calling immersive philosophy. And really rethinking in epistemological level of rather than like being in philosophy and doing that here and then you know at nine o'clock doing art something like that or whatever in fact being immersed into it so that it's not to say that everything bleeds and falls into one big pot because that would also not work but that things have their nuances that's why I like thinking in terms of dimensions as opposed to layers I think they're, they're more helpful. I was a painter as well, the day was structured differently. You know, mm. The day would start and fall into the painting straight away. So I've just been curious about yeah. moving Thanks. things around a bit, maybe mm. change, see what happens. Interesting. Oh, no. Uh, Lauren. Yes, I'm, I'm Lauren. Can you hear her? I'm Lauren. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and yes, my work is on artists' face. Politicality of the um, politicality of the event and artist event, and um, I mean this is I uh, should make it more varied rather than repeat. Um, so uh, I'm not feeling so connected to research this week because I was just focusing so much on that uh, 
finding a book. I suppose to say something. In, like last week, I said, uh, "Passion is not identity." So, in that. But then, of course, it, it goes and reflects right back on what Mark has just said, where he's basically saying that pattern is identity. Like having a very specific pattern, or even not a specific a pattern. Creates an identity, and you're suggesting. Yeah, it's like, I disagree with that. Like identity as a sort of. I mean, this is like in terms of his lecture three. Is he? He's he's still not escaping identity because he's he's sort of saying there's a essentializing or is essential provenance of um, uh, relates to identity as opposed to the principle of identity, uh, and this uh, essential provenance of identity which creates the event. Appropriation um, is, is to do with the essence sin, but really that just still brings back to me this. It doesn't really escape this identity. You're still installing it back where the pattern is. Just because this pattern doesn't mean there's an entity. So. Um, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No. Go on. Uh, uh, I'm very excited because this week I get to um, work on my project. Okay, not, um, it's called uh, Same Thing But Different. I've been trying to uh, get funding for it for like two years now. Um, Wait, let's start again. Name. Same Thing But Different. No, not the my name. name <laughs> my name's Di. My name's Di. I meant for the web. Not okay, my name's Di Wiltshire. Um, this week I'm going to work on my own project, which um, I've been distracted by lots of other things. So uh, yeah, very excited about that. Moving into my new studio and everything. Which is where? Um, at the Lombard Method. So in Lugba, um, what's it look like? It looks a mess. <laughs> it's at one big room which smells really damp and uh, it's really cold. There's lots of other artists there, so that's why I'm moving in instead of being in isolation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so uh, yeah, well, what it works about, I think. Um, I've, I've been trying to th think of it. I think it's about survival. It's a, that's a new way of thinking about it. And when you say your work, what does it literally look like? I mean, is it paint, sculpture, uh, no. singing? I've been trying to make it up for the last three years, try and make an archive. Um, so are people's um, collecting sound and um, written work from, a, from participants and photographs and um, small video um, pictures. But then I can't try it. Then you lost your hard drive? Yeah, about um, two weeks ago now. Three Why are you and a half years because I've moaned. Is he? I've moaned about it a lot. Is 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 Mark your hard drive? Is that no, Mark's my the person that Oops. I. Uh, Sorry, that was yeah. just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that I talked to about it. Um, yeah, so three and a half years of work. So um, I decided that, it, that this is a good thing, not a bad thing. And that's that's uh, not like a Mark <laughs> remark. <laughs> and then it's yeah, we'll go forward with. Uh, New things, but, but but basically getting an archive together because then I wanted to use these ideas, people's uh, participants' ideas, to make um, this space an immersive space that reacts to probably by a feedback of other people. So it's that that's what I'm doing this week. Really interesting. And how many people are in the um, studio? Um, well, I've met I've only met four, but I think there's a, <laughs> there's a few more. Huh. And when you say archive. I mean, does it look like books on a shelf? Does it? What well, it would have been web. Is it in, web design? No, it would have been just these were all. It would have been categorised into different uh, conversations in a way, but and uh, images and stuff. So like you're that. just starting that all over again? No, because luckily I've got quite a bit in other places because I'm quite chaotic, so that was useful. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to try and put all these together, and I've got all my written stuff. I've, I've got. Which makes me think that you know oh, they should keep things in books and folders, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be much better. Yeah, but yeah. Thanks. So good. Good. This sounds great. And you're doing your application. Yeah, doing my application. Okay. Doing your application. Doing your application. Mm. Doing your application. You've already done it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. About which? Um, Wait. Quick. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Barnaby. Yeah. Um. I'm Barnaby Adams, and uh, my and I interests... I am the voice of God. <laughs> <laughs> can, you hear, can you hear me okay? Really? Yeah. Yeah. I'll definitely hear you. Um, I, really, uh, I think that my research interests are uh, 
just realised this morning that it's it's all about um, identity and difference. And that these are the these are the great big themes, and they are the things that I'm interested in. Um, and what I'm interested in about identity and difference is is getting into the inside of them. Um, the inside of what? Identity and difference, uh, and exploring their their interiority, um, and listening to their interiority. Not listening to it, hearing it, um, and in the same kind of way that uh, that uh, Lauren was talking about um, this immersion thing. Um, I think that there's there. I think that there's this um, this uh, Heideggerian idea between um, esoteric and aleutheic uh, visions, and I think this this is. We all seem to want to lean towards this anthaic kind of immersive, um, sort of uh, marginal, behind the head uh, kind of way of experiencing things. And I think that I try to uh, analogize that through constantly uh, talking about noise and sound. But um, I think other people find different methods to uh, to uh, analyze analogize it. But, but I, still, um, I still don't understand what you mean by interiority of difference. I don't know what that. I literally don't know what you mean. Like either uh, visually or analytically. Uh, to, uh, not to not know what it means. Um, it's it's uh, to experience it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, without kind of without cons without considering it from a, without having a perspective. So to try to, to to try to experience it by eliminating a perspective. Wouldn't that be the case with like sex, for example? I mean, I'm um, serious. In, I mean, in the sense that one doesn't, I mean, normally, or not normally, but at least in some respects, one wouldn't be conscious. I mean, one's conscious, but I mean, one's not making a rational, you know, if X, then Y scenario. And yeah, therefore, I, 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 there's, you're not coming, you're not coming to the, to the environment of a, a sexual engagement uh, or a sensuous engagement, let's say, with a predefined map. And if you are, it's right. going to be pretty crummy sex, really. So, yeah, it's it's the it's a, a kind of if you wanted to use that as an analogy, then it's the sort of uh, the experience. I, I want to try to um, go with identity and difference, like the inhabiting of sex, rather than the kind of observing of it. Even if you're participating and observing, you know. So it's like it's trying to kind of eliminate this detachment by um, by some kind of occupying an interior, uh, an interiority of these con of these concepts, which perhaps don't exist until uh, until I form them or, or they're or they're formed or you know in some sort of in some sort of gesture of, of free will. So the I who's forming this is an embodied I. So there's, um, an, so there's an intentionality involved. Yeah, I, I think there's a there's a um, I would like to put it like there's a That's a trap. There's, um, well, I, I'm going to probably step right into it. I would yeah. like to say uh, there's an implication uh, of guilt in doing it, and I would say that the judgment is probably guilty. And I, I mean that in kind of the fullest sense of the word. Which so yes, the I, the I is implied, and the free will, I'd like to associate that with a kind of, with guilt, with guilty uh, verdict. Okay. So that the, the, the visual... The notion of, let's say, visual representation, or the the um, the idea of sort of the, everything from peeping tom to just the vision, visual culture, is a guilty, as in, will always already bring in a judgment. Is that what you're suggesting? And you're, uh, what you're, I'm trying to say is all all free will, all exercise of free will is is uh, uh, condemned with a guilty verdict. So if you're getting inside, if you're getting inside, uh, entering into an interior, then you are making decisions. You're exercising this free will, um, but it's uh, it's a kind, of, it's a flawed and a guilty process. So let's look at the Pope, the yeah. one that just quit. <clears throat> so he's come into an environment that is that it, that is in of itself an interiority. Right, meaning which environment? The Vatican or? Yeah, the Vatican, and not only that, the papacy. 
Right. Right. The papacy moves from being, you know, kind of like a job to the divine on earth. So he's so he, it's an example of it's a religious example of of being this interiority writ large. It's kind of what you were talking about actually earlier. Thinking. So the interiority that he embodies, he embodies the interiority of the mind of God on earth. Okay. And then he quits. Yeah. So can if if that's the case, if if how I've held this out to you is correct. Mm -hmm. Can it further then be said that one can get outside of an interiority? One can get outside of interiority. Yeah. And if one does get outside interiority, that outsideness becomes an embodied human thing, a human embodiment. Whereas when it's inside the interiority, it's experiential at the level of unlimited limit. There's no intentionality. So I'm not sure where the guilt comes in. Um, I, I would say that's 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 pretty much exactly what I mean. Um, the, in using using the uh, example, uh, the he is he is guilty, um, or rather he was guilty when he was occupying the interiority, i.e., either the Vatican itself or the office of the papacy. So he is he is guilty, and then he is he is probably committed his last act, his last guilty act, by exercising his, his kind of ultimate free will um, by uh, resigning. Right. I mean, and is now, it possible now he's, he now he's be guilty of something? These institutions, he's no longer kind of interested. Interesting. Well, that's true. But is it true that he, that, are you suggesting that there's this thing called guilt that is sort of a homogeneous category or can one be guilty of something within the interiority? I think that um, that free will and its exercise is synonymous. Um, I realize that's what a radical thing I'm about to say is synonymous with guilt. No, it's not radical, it's tautological. So I'm just trying to get a sense of, I mean, it may also be radical, but I'm just trying to get a sense of whether or not guilt can be uh, sort of um, more erudite, in a certain sense, or more uh, specific, more particular. Yeah, I'm not sure is the answer, okay. or is, is my current position. Hmm. But it's interesting. Anybody have questions on anything that anybody's raised so far? Uh, for some reason, I associate, Can you hear him? For some reason, I associate guilt with difference, the return difference. Guilt with difference? Yes, so the interiority tells me a continuity. Then, Can you hear him? Right. Yeah, okay. yes. And then uh, the real difference in what crazes it, giving, giving it patterns, if you were know, we talking about, but giving it um, textures, otherwise, otherwise it would be a smooth thing. Not guilty, but at the same time, not, not interesting, not active. Not. And would you say that guilt is the same as shame? No, 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 and no, so no, why, not so. why guilt and not shame? Guilt is, guilt is if I wanted to try to expand it, I'd say it's a kind of, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking of it as a kind of contingency, that, there's, that there is, a, um, I, I don't think Matthias is wrong when he says that there's, that there's something to do with difference here as well, you know, I, perhaps just a kind of different intensity. Um, and it's a kind of like an existential contingency, which I think is the, both the free will, will and the guilt. And I do take the point that it's, that what I'm suggesting is, well, I'm setting up as a tautology. Okay. Okay. Let's. Leave. I think this is a good entry point into today's discussion, anyway, uh, because we're going to get into identity and difference and really try and nail this as best we can. Um, what I was worried about with last, uh, I, I thought the last sem seminar was excellent. Uh, it was just when we started to really talk about identity uh, that I was a little bit worried that people weren't. Um, weren't, weren't realizing that there's still a form of difference within Heideggerian identity that is different than the difference that's outside of his. Own. So, so in other words, with identity, he's got a so-called interiority aspect, which would be difference. But then there's this other thing called difference that he also speaks about. And I want to see if we can get to the nub of that. Who's who's presenting today? Well, I am speaking with you. Yeah. Why don't you? Yep. Yeah. Why don't you uh, continue? Mm -hmm. Lauren, are you going to be speaking as well?
That's right, you can speak. speak. You said to do uh, just the introduction. Won't take us quite five minutes, I guess. Do you want to go first then and not, Matthias? I don't mind. Why don't we have you go first? Okay. Now, and you did your introduction on the introduction. Yeah, you, okay. Okay, so. So can you just, for the purposes of archiving, yeah. literally, <laughs> can you just say where that's from? Okay, it's from the introduction. How you say it? Heidegger. Heidegger, but it's the James Sandberg introduction. Okay, so. To identity and difference in Heidegger. Sorry. Right, so um, I'm going to talk about identity, experience, flow, my own work, uh, relation, yeah. technology. This is going to take five minutes. In about ten minutes. Okay. I apologize for the many, it's like, I'm kind of, and it's for me. But uh, I have a big piece of paper that if I'm wrong, you can write it. Okay. But, Do you okay, want to unfold right. that paper for us? Uh, there you go. I don't understand what we're supposed to do with this paper. Right. Um, uh, reading Heidegger for me is like this. If you think that you know what you're on about then you're missing your point but if you're confused then you're probably onto something okay so i've got a quote from page 11 is being and man can only be thought from nature of identity itself well, identity wait, is wait, different wait, wait, from wait, get distraction okay. okay identity is different for heidegger than the long-standing ideas that are presented in western philosophy method physics is representing represents identity as characteristics of being or metaphysics thinks identity is a fundamental trait of being for me, what does that mean? So it's coming from it, that instead of coming from the other way around? Yeah, good. Right. That's it. For me, this is like um, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And well, thanks to Darwin and amongst others, we know it's the egg. For Heidegger, <laughs> it's also searching for fundamental truths. For Heidegger, the fundamental truth about identity is being and thought belong to identity, not the other way around. Okay, it's a quote from page 14. For Heidegger, being and thought belong to identity, whose acting nature stems from letting belong together, which is called the event appropriation. Okay, stop right there. It's going very, very fast. Yeah. Read. <sighs> the event appropriation. No, no, no. no. I, I didn't mean to go on. I it's read. Stop. <laughs> now, now, just what does it mean to say that thought? What does it mean to say that what Heidegger is doing is reversed? to what metaphysics suggests is being done with identity. Can you just elaborate on that a little okay, bit? Okay, so they're saying that um, something to do with the ground and something to do with... And what is that to do with the ground? Well, I think, when I looked it up, um, I read, it, it's like a tree. <laughs> okay. That's what, and then the metaphysics comes from the reason, and physics is the trunk, and then all the other sciences from the top. And so the ground part is like the God part, the transcendental part, the part that we're supposed to have come from something else, and there's this Continuality of stuff? No? No. But it's okay. a good guess. Just right. Completely wrong. Can you write that on my piece of paper then? <laughs> yes, Dane, would you be the secretary here, Thank please? Am I right? What ground is? <laughs> <laughs> now, that's first. I mean, I have to say that's the first in all the seminars I've ever had to have a student give a paper and then ask them else to take the notes. Fantastic. <laughs> 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 Brilliant. Well done. Okay, so now the ground. One uses the notion of ground in order to say that something has a meaning that can be stable. Okay. That is to say, it can be rooted somehow. Um, okay, go on. Uh, okay, so the event of procreation is the translation from one of the German words for experience. Wait, wait, so the ground is something that creates a, a stability. Now, I'm repeating this for all of us, because even for those of you that are long in the tooth about this, it still haunts uh, one's work by not realizing that this ground is actually meant in, in the Heideggerian mood to be a surface. Okay. And that's what's very important. So the surface or region or the relation is what creates the stability. <laughs> Got that? <laughs> right, the surface is the relation that the surface is the ground. The surface is the ground, right. But the ground but but what that doesn't mean there's any roots. There's nothing underneath the, the surface. There's nothing that holds it beyond just the fact that it can be held. So what Barnaby was saying in terms of his work on uh, this interiority and guilt, he's using one to ground the other. 
and at the, at the moment, he's not quite sure which one is the ground and which one's not the ground. And in a certain sense, they're both the ground and both not the ground. But what Heidegger is doing here is, is challenging the argument that's presented in metaphysics, that, that there is something that you can put your hooks into and make an identity stable. OK. OK? Yeah. And he's saying that that's not what makes identity. OK. It's not the ability that you can ground it as such. Because he's saying it's dynamic. Identity. Well, they all say it's dynamic, okay. right? Because otherwise, it would only be God that bestows identity. And we know that since God can quit, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's always a bit of an issue. Um, OK, so go on. All right. Um, event appropriation is the translation from one of the German words for experience. Um, uh, how do you say that? Uh, the uh, one. Here again, this. Yep. Which for now means uh, shared experience rather than private experience. No. So you're saying event of appropriation. Yeah. We need a wider definition here. Okay. Or a wider sense of what it means. Can you please write that by experience, what the wider definition is? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone want to give it a go? Mattia? Well, I think that's <coughs> partly what you're talking about anyway. Yes. Um, well, it, it, how far should I stop it? Um, Not too far. Um, She's only got 10 minutes. It, it, is, <laughs> it is dynamic and it is experience. And it, what, what, where it was, what wasn't correct to me is that um, Heidegger speaks of um, the shift from converting all attention onto being to which identity is a predicate of the property of being. Say that again. If Heidegger says the tradition uh, projects identity as a property of being. So tradition suggests that identity is the property of being, which is exactly what you were saying, Barnaby, and why it was a problem. Okay, yeah, well, and because Heidegger plays a lot of words, property in this sense is both physical property, something that belongs to being, but also something you can predicate of being. So it could be, property could mean like a, a, the an identifying of, mark. Yes, it were. the kind of proper to being. Yeah. And something that being possesses. OK. Now, he rejects these uh, as a projection that conceals the real situation. Right. And uh, says that um, being, it, it changes. It's not obviously the opposite, because he's moving away from the idea of opposite. And he speaks. Um, of being and thinking belonging into the same. And the same would be the abyss from the previous part. No, that's too fast. Just, just, just that's enough. Did that make sense to you, Dick? Yeah, that, that, that made sense to me, but then I don't understand why I'm wrong. Or I'm not wrong, I was just not deep enough. Not no, you're wrong further. No, I think it was actually wrong. It was just wrong. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't <laughs> just wrong. It was, it was, it was, it was a well wrong. done wrong. It was, it okay, was an excellent right. wrong. Right, okay. Um, so it's just wrong. No, no, it's not just wrong. It's, like I said, um, what were you going to say? No, I was asking, to, to complete it again. From, you go by die or D? I, I get cool. No, but what do you die? Die. 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 Yeah. As in living. Yeah. Die. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. um, I, get, I get what you said about uh, being, how traditionally it's the other way around, and how Heidegger is saying it's identity. Being is still long to identity rather than the, the traditional way, and I get that right. I probably then take up an event appreciationism because I thought that was a kind of um, experience that is a shared experience, but that's the bit that's wrong. Well, uh, the shared experience, I see why you think it isn't entirely wrong after what we said. Um, it's not a shared experience as um, group hug. Group hug or two people experiencing the same. No, but it's something that. But it is is a fact. It's a bit like gravity. You cannot have gravity if there's only one particle. You need two particles. Th that's what happens there. The, okay. The the um, you need one particle of gravity. But you need an object to which it will be. Yeah, you cannot. Gravitoid. Gravitoid. <laughs> it, 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 you, you cannot. That's not attract itself. You know? Right. It, you know, it's a relation. Um, between one thing that was understood as essence, as in the ground before, and now does not have a, no longer have a meaning by itself, which is being the capital B, the infinity of to be. And, and then 
the historical beings, humans as he calls them in the specific uh, lecture work, which are um, open to that being and calling it into the presence, and vice versa, that major being, major as infinity, not God, um, is their essence. So there is a, is a, is a dialogue, dialogical uh, kind of uh, relationship, which is their identity either way. So, uh, Barbie, you want to give it a go as well, this notion of event of appropriation. Because what, what Di had said, which you might not have heard, or if you heard it, you, you might not have heard it exactly, um, was that event of appropriation meant that it was more than, it was like a group involvement, and that was incorrect. Can you, yeah, yeah, can you also the, give it a go? The, the event of appropriation is, um, is the pulling away from identity or the ground um, and uh, this kind of, uh, this sort of wrench or leap um, is what Heidegger calls the event of appropriation. And but it's ha ha it happens okay. as a kind of um, uh, the experience of singularity rather than a kind of any, I mean if you, if you, if you take that being uh, these kind of gerunds that we were talking about last week. If you if you imagine that those are sort of um, common. I, sorry, just a second, Barry. Everyone knows what a gerund is, right? I N G. That's a gerund. Anything with an I N G at the end. Swimming, walking, running, talking. Ing is a gerund. It's a move. It's a transitive verb. Verb. It makes something move. Go on. And as a, as a transitive verb, um, which makes something move, it tends to be uh, associated with. Uh, the oh, it opens up rather the possibility for shared experience, but I think the uh, the Heideggerian event of appropriation is um, a kind of schism away from this these uh, this collection of gerunds, um, and uh, it's this sort of uh, I mean he calls it a well he doesn't call it he, it's translated as a, a leaping away, but I think this 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 I don't know if it's quite a rejection, but this leap um, or or uh, oblique movement, shall we say, and it is a movement, um, becomes uh, Heideggerian, uh, the Heideggerian event of appropriation. Okay, so I get it, it's the, it's the same that you do. Well, but what's important here is that one has to think away from the usual understanding of many or singular, like, you know, the I, like individual versus a lot of people. And when one thinks about uh, numbers, let's say, or the multi multiple or the manifold, you're actually talking about a singularity, uh, or you're talking about dimensions. So, so you're not talking about numbers as such, because the singularity is all, always plural in the sense that a singularity denotes a relation, which has no weight or no pattern or whatever, it's just this relation. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can see why it was not quite as, it was a brave but wrong Futile. attempt. <laughs> Futile. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. Okay, okay. Right. thank you, Barbie. Thank you, Matias. Thank you. Okay, go on. Thank you. Dane. <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, okay, this is all very well and good if you understand what being, big being is. So Heidegger thinks that, for now, Heidegger thinks that the three modes of big being, so being substance understood as self-sufficient with properties, for example wood, certain properties and characteristics, its hardness, it burns, etc. The properties of substance are intrinsic to that substance. And T being equipment understood as holistic or perhaps transparent equipment only makes sense when they merge with a way of being, for example, a hammer doesn't make sense in a culture without nails. Okay. And then number three it does sorry, sorry. Why does Muhammad Muhammad? A hammer. Oh, a hammer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we see. Uh, right, number three is the sign. How rumors begin. Yeah. <laughs> Mohammed does not make sense in a society without nails. Please. Yeah, that's good. That's actually like an art project. <laughs> right, okay. So starting to me feels like um, a non-linear narrative. For example, when you, you surf the web, okay, I exist and time and space structures are infinite and I, they're relative to me and the way I interact and where I enter and leave and what I'm doing while I'm there. So I kind of like, that's, sorry to do that, it's a kind of thing, right? And then I... You, um, you'll get rid of that. 
hit rid of that, that's wrong as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, good. No kind of, no. No, it's, I just, no kind of, no yeah. sort of, no, just about. Um, so, but is that kind of. Lauren is. No, I just know I have a habit of sort of. Yeah. yeah. Band. Is that, is that um, a picture in my head that I can hold on to for a bit? As long as you don't say it out loud. Better. Okay. Uh, does dying can be distinguished as a special mode of being in terms of existential structure of its being? Wait, 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 wait. Dasein, did you say? Design. Dasein. 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 Okay, yeah. sorry. That's right. No, no, no. It's a, I'm not trying to correct you for mispronunciation because God knows if you follow my pronunciation, you're really in trouble. But, uh, but rather what you're actually saying. Um, is that something that you've thought through? Um, no, it's something I have watched and lecture about. Okay, because I think that that's not quite what you want to say. How come existentialism got into this picture? Uh, because that's how I thought it. Should I carry on and just cross that out for a moment? Okay. Right, uh, the structure is generally referred to by Heidegger as the care structure. Yeah. Not okay. in this reading. Really. Right. You need to shoot the lecture. Okay. <laughs> you borrowed this from. Right. Um, okay, so it's getting on about. Um, it's many years, many years ago, I've done more, so all. Right, so then it said in this lecture that I watched then. So the care structure can be defined in terms of humans being ahead of itself and being already in the world. So um, being <coughs> ahead of beings, humans that have the capacity, but often live with in future possibilities. So, and the example he gave was parenting, and I thought about education. So, we're going to have to. Can you, first of all, yes. can you give us the details of this lecture that you. It's a very big and tight Yeah. Yeah. So, it just uh, sounds very young. <laughs> what's, what, what's the uh, YouTube? Yep. Or what's the. Uh, yes, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you're but just, just right. Us. I can't. C R C Dreyfus. 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 Yeah. Dreyfus. And what did Dreyfus? What's the rest of it? Oh, we say lectures from Heidegger. Lectures of Heidegger. If you look it up on YouTube. Okay. Okay. Dreyfus. Right. I'm going to. Now the reason that is not correct, although Dreyfus is a good person to uh, go to on Heidegger. Yeah. Um, but here's the reason why you should always rely on yourself first. Okay. And all become Americans. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to bring that. But you should not be afraid to be wrong, because a lot of these people that you might borrow from are trying to push a different agenda. Okay. You know, and and Hubert Dreyfus is he's not it's not that he's trying to be a secret agenda. It's just that he's got his own way of interpreting it, and your way of interpreting it would be far more interesting, because you are an intelligent, interesting person. Right. Okay, so I would suggest just getting rid of old Dreyfus. Right, okay. um, and that what you need to do is to just read Heidegger and drink a lot of wine or a lot of water, depending on where you're coming from, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever, uh, in order to um, get a sense of what is the problem. Why is he banging on about this, apart from the fact that, you know, he just is? What is the problem about identity and different? What's the passion behind this? Can you can you think about it? Like with your own work, what's the passion behind this identity and difference? Mm -hmm. Or just identity? Or Dasein? What's the Dasein here? Yeah. Okay. So should I just do this again? Yeah. yeah. Is that okay? That's absolutely fine. There was one part that um, when he goes, this which is my, should I just read? Yeah, your part okay, is more interesting. So then he goes, um, this quote from, man does not have static essence of animal rationale or subject of thinking and object. One of Heidegger's most basic insight is that we do not know what man is, even if we understood as what, if we, even if we understood what, what at all. To understand of being is subjective because man is involved in the understanding of simple thoughts. So, is that yours? No, that's, that's, <laughs> that's her. Yeah, Hubert. So that's the quote. And so then that's the way I've understood this is this, um, that there isn't any um, separation, so external and internal and stuff okay, like that. Okay, that's good. And yes. so then I understood it about the ideas of flow. Good. Right? And then, and then, no, the ideas, on this. That's good. 
of the embodied mind. I say this with love. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that, that, there you go. That no, but what do you mean by flow? Um, I can't read his name either, but that's, I looked, you know. Um, Whose name? Lauren Helper. serious thing. The thing about being in the PhD, which you are right and ready to be in, is that you are smart. And you need to like find your feet. Because if you read these other people, they're going to pull your head around in many different directions. And you will not know your your backside from your elbow, as we say in the in the in the in the new world. And that's no good. So the thing is, is that your little tiny toe in the water with Heidegger, with the thing about the flow, is really important. Okay. And that you got that, despite the fact that you're being beat over the head by either drivers on the one hand or unpronounceable name on the other. Yeah. You know, um, is remarkable. Now, if you're going to read a secondary source on these things, then the secondary source you should read is really like Joan Stamberg. Okay. And the reason I say this is because there are a zillion and one, you know, lift or walk, find an interpretation on Heidegger or whomever. So you only have so many hours in the day. So you need to lift or walk that will at least give you the classic line that yep. you can then reject <laughs> if you want. But then you'll at least know what the classic line is on it. So that's why, pardon me, if you go to a secondary source, then you go to a secondary source in order to, um, in order to get, get the line, as it were. Because like you say, when you're learning this stuff, you don't know, like, you, know, you read, look at these words and they're like, you know, just kind of float off the page. Kind of thing. Uh, especially as I was always told never to read Heidegger. Who told you that? My, all my lectures. Really? Ah, uh, you come to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do it. Yeah, no, no. Um, so, did they have a reason for him not to do it? Um, because it's, he never says, I don't know. I actually, means no, and all yeah. this kind of thing. Yeah, I absolutely 100% understand why it's moving up to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, the real problem with Heidegger is that once you do read him, and once you start actually understanding a little bit of what he's saying, yeah. it gets very addictive. Yeah, but how do you know when you know what he's saying, that you know that you, he, you know what he's saying? Does anybody have an answer to that? How do you know? Barley? How do, I, how do you know what? How do you know whether you're getting what he's saying? Yeah. yeah. Um. Well, <laughs> I'm assuming not. I'm in a position to actually uh, have a have a view on that. I don't know. It. it uh, I, I suppose one of the one of the ways is um. You stop groaning inwardly when you uh, when you actually the the the. The word Heidegger, or the, the proper name Heidegger, doesn't elicit a kind of um, an emetic response in you, uh, and instead of sort of going, <laughs> <laughs> you suddenly sort of think, hmm, there might be something in this. But, uh, but I, 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 all I can say is, I, I, is um, not having the fear. I mean, effectively, the worry, the biggest, the biggest hurdle is the worry that you're not getting it, and if you just like. Uh, you know, if you don't, just don't care that much, then it's a lot easier. 
Okay, yeah. I'll try not to care. Yeah. See, that's yeah, the main try, not, try not to care. Sorry, I think the kidding. wine is really good uh, recommendation to Johnny, actually. That's right. <laughs> so and I think it's true for almost all the philosophers. Okay, I'm fine with, with the exception of more present company. Crazy than anybody else. Yes, right. Dane. Uh, well, he says in the start questions, because say technology just needs says, don't get bogged down in what in the particular words and sentences I use. Don't get stuck in the develop a way to let's say navigate through it. And, pick it up as you go along, you don't get stuck, caught mm -hmm. up in language <coughs> tricks or anything like that. It's, yes, that's it's very important. Right. Yeah, that's exactly that's how it, and I think that uh, it's true of one's artwork as well, you know, because if you know sort of a transparent relationship to your own work, usually it's crap work. <coughs> if you, you know, you need to kind of, you know, feel your way around it. Right. Having said that, what's well, your last? Yeah, and I fear saying that this, these two last few bits. Right, um, so I'm briefly going to talk about my own work. Um, when I feel a little jaded, instead of writing an artist statement or filling an application form, I wish I could just say same thing but different. And the people would understand fully and may support me the value of my work and just let me get on with it. However, I acknowledge the importance of the conceptual idea behind the statement to be like an equation for the multiple possibilities and interpretations. The ideas of Perhaps philosophy helps me understand further, but um, and perhaps see better. But most importantly, articulate it to others in a useful way. Other titles for projects or combinations of words are for me like case studies for same same but different, stolen from experience design, conversation mining, and sentiment analysis. They make me feel in a certain way. It, it's like a manifold of possible meanings, or you could say that the philosophical bit. <laughs> that makes them important. How these words make me feel kind of feels like the A, A, A equals A thing, and I don't know why. Like the alcoholic anonymous. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, that makes me feel like that. the AA. <laughs> so um, now, I have, that now I have to find out why that is. And so then I thought that it's probably because it's all to do with relation. Hmm. And so then I was like, um, it's not the actual components of it. It, it is just the relation bit, and then I, I kind of understood that part of the relation bit. And then I took, um, think about technology, and I've done exactly the same as what you told me not to do just a moment ago. And so um, his ideas for technology, then the, I related that in my head to technologies of the self, because I've read that book. Well. Yeah. Anyway, so. And what, what about the technologies of the self? But I thought that's what he means by technology as well. But what is it? Um, well, like, what does it mean to have a technology? Here, yeah, it's like a series of techniques that allow individuals to work on themselves by regulating. But what does it mean to have a technique on yourself? Does it mean like masturbation, or does it mean like taking a walk, or what? Is, what is a it's self like a framework technique? Framework or a structure from yourself, uh, an idea or something. Before you know, is it a, a way of not really? Doing See, that's why I'm pushing you on this because um, even with Foucault, we have a little discussion with your lecturers. But even with Foucault, um, in his te technique, the technologies of self, a technology can never happen outside of a relation. Because a, a tech technology is the art of the technique. It's the logic of the technique. It's the logic of the technique. It's the logic of the techna, which is already an art. So it's a practice. And the practice gets you know, kind of embodied in a relational environment. So Foucault's arguments are all establishing around, like he talks about epitectus, epitectus and the walks you know, that you take in order to discipline the body. But the, the walk itself is in relation to the nature that you're around. It's not like you're just walking on air or just you know, doing a running machine thing, like at the gym you were talking about earlier. Um, so, so, there's all, so to discipline the self, the, by discipline, he doesn't mean you know put put on like uh, hardcore leather and you know be immobile. It's not discipline in this kind of like rigid, rig rigidifying. It means to be able to become skilled. The body becomes skilled, and it becomes skilled at producing itself. Okay. And and that for that that's a very Epicurean um, moment. It's it, then it gets into the whole relationship with Epictetus, like I was saying, and also um, he quotes in the Technologies of the Self. He Gets into this uh, discussion around. It's actually not the tech. It's in um, it's in care of the self, where he talks about um, uh, that one always learns who they are through the eye of the other. 
so you end up being reflected back to, you don't just okay. learn about yourself by sitting there, you know, looking at your toe. Mm -hmm. um, and, but even then, you could look at learn, it, learn about yourself looking at your toe, but it's a relation. It's just not self-reflexive, like in the Kantian relationship, which I'll get back to, but I don't want to get off track. Okay. Any, any questions on this so far for Di? For Di? For Di? I don't mind. No, no, I, I like to, it's <laughs> kind of correct. It's kind of correct. Di. And Di is much better than D. I mean, of the two. Because Di, you know, has many implications. Okay, Mark, did you want to say something? No. Lauren? No. Okay, I've got the last thing that oh, sorry. Like, again, leaves us on is the question. Do, do uh, Western languages have intrinsic metaphysical structures so that they are forever destined to be on theological in nature and do not harbor other possibilities of thinking? And so then I was like, is this why metaphor is so important? Hmm, that's interesting. So the question came from where? That's the last thing in this. In, in Stamberg? Yeah. And she asked? No, she says that Heidegger leaves us with this last question. And the question is, are all languages intrinsic always already metaphysical? Structure. And so then we're forever destined to be onto theological in nature, and do they harbor other, and do, um, or do they harbor other possibilities of thinking? So, and your answer? And my answer was saying that's why I'm is okay, that, well, well it's a, a critique, I mean, for is Heidegger, he's critiquing metaphor, really. He's critiquing representation. So, but, so, he's, so, instead of using, using language to use, to create pictures, uh, that's, what my, that's what I was thinking about. But, but language, um, in the broad sense of communicating, not like French, German, English type of thing, right? So, language as a form of communication, so it could be a mathematical thing, and Basically, the answer that Heidegger eventually comes to is that that you can't get out of metaphysics. Basically, okay. Now the question is, um, or if you do get out of metaphysics, it'll be so chaotic that what you're what you end up with is a problematized environment that's um, that's sort of not very helpful. I mean, Mark, you you mentioned you probably did this at the outset of your yeah. discussion. Can you make a couple of remarks to help Guy? Um, yeah, yeah, I think um, some lots of help die. Um, well, just on the, on the question of uh, why would a language ipso facto be metaphysical and why would that necessarily be a problem? Uh, um, a language, a metaphysical language for Heidegger, sort of a fundamental concept, is comprehensive in the sense that it reintroduces uh, an individual to a totality, and it puts the individual always into the question. So it's a question of um, being in um, general nature, then it puts you, the individual, into the same question. So the question is about being, and the question is say, about movement. <coughs> All, all, all beings. Right, I'm cute. All what are you doing, Barnaby? He's moving. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, 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 he's illustrating the question of the, the, the movement of beings. If, if your question is, is, well, the movement in its like, general sense, then at the same time, I think what Heidegger, in his quest to look at the origin of metaphysics in the Aristotelian um, sense, let's say, also looks at the question of being in their self preserving sameness, so it looks at this comprehensive question in, uh, uh, of the individual within the totality, within the being of being, if you like. Well, so um, I think that's the, the, ori the original question that, Heid that Heidegger um, keeps referring to, the remembrance of being, is this question of the fully comprehensive questions within metaphysics, what is the individual, what is the world, those kind of questions, and it brings that together with a totality of being, brings it within a totality, and it operates somewhere. Did you get that, Di? That nope. Kind of <laughs> That's okay. We'll, we'll let that rest for a second. Did you, can you give it a go? No. Okay, so we're going to, but thank you. I mean, I think what would be helpful is that, um, no, I keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just next week, it. um, next week, what are we doing next week? Because, Barnaby, you were supposed to be doing something next week, but you're, you're not, you're going to be in Paris next week. In Bordeaux, yes. Bordeaux, sorry. Um, yeah. Grace, 
Yeah, that's it. Okay. There's going to be um, also um, one of our um, prospective PhD students, um, Bernadette um, Oslinger, is coming um, uh, next week. You know Bernadette. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she'll be here. Um, so, and Barnaby, are you going to be Skyping? Yeah. Yeah, so you'll be here ish. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, so, but next week then, when we talk about, uh, what are you guys doing next week? Um, second chapter. You're going to be doing the different side of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll still call on you. But maybe you and I could have a, a little discussion beforehand, because I think that there's a little bits of stuff that you just need to catch up on mm -hmm. that will help you. Yeah. And, and also, the other thing is is that um, we just did an intense three-hour se session on identity in the MA class, which was quite mad. <laughs> so mad that even I was saying to the camera, <laughs> I think it's even, even for me, I think it's a little bit over the top. Uh, but it might be worth looking at. Okay. Um, and Grace has the uh, list. What was sent to Yeah, yeah you've got the list sent around. So the one on identity that we did at the MA right. level, we'll do it. Okay. Over to you. Uh, well, I think I'm from, from um, what Mark just said, uh -huh. and that he find still a bit obscure. Um, in the previous two uh, chapter of this lecture, that uh, presented last week, there were, to me, two main points that I can bring up. In the first is that the principles of thought cannot be explained because as soon as you start trying to explain them, you're already thinking. So there is a circularity, which is the same circular. There, there is a moment of the axioms. Once you try to uh, demonstrate the axioms of arithmetics, or the axioms of thought in this case, uh, you are already using them, so they turned out to be undemonstrable. And then it's a good goal of physics of mathematics. Can you repeat that, just in case people didn't get that? Did you get that, Barnaby? No. Because this is what your work is doing. The, okay. the problems that Heidegger starts from, that Lorraine introduced last week, now there are two points. But the first one is that the basic principles of thinking, which are identity, non-contradiction, and x to the middle, a equal a, a, a is different than non-a. One thing is either a or non-a, or non-a, there, there is no third option available. These are the three things he lists as the basic principle of thinking. You want to say it again? Yeah. A equals A. A. <laughs> a. <laughs> a. <laughs> you are good. Identity. <laughs> that and that's a principle of identity. Then the principle of non contradiction that A is different or equal plus a slash across non A. So the first principle of identity is A is A. a. This, the, or, no, no, the first principle of thinking, thinking. that he's criticizing, okay, a, right, is that A equals A. And that goes with A is different than known A. Which is the second principle of thinking, which is not the same thing as saying A is in contradiction to not A, so that A is on every side that not A is on, but rather that A is not not A. And then the third one is the principle of the excluded middle that one thing is either A or not A. There are no other options if one has to boil it down to these maximum or absolute definitions. So the excluded middle. Excluded middle is that which is in between all A on the one hand and all not A on the other hand. <coughs> and what I was the reason I said to you, Barnaby, that I thought this was calling to you at some level is because I was just concerned about the way in which you raised the question of interiority. Not that you raised it linked to guilt, which I think is quite interesting, but it sounded like you were privileging one of the traditional forms of thinking which would go against your argument in the long run. Okay. Um, I didn't, the, this third principle, I didn't understand the difference between the, the um, could you, could you just repeat the third principle there? Actually, the second principle. Because the second principle... Uh, a does not equal non-A with the second. What was the third? A so, does not equal... A is not not A. Lecture, yeah. lecture 1, page 77. Lecture yeah. 1, page 77. You have those Bremen lectures? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Okay, I sorry, I, just, I thought you'd moved on to the third one already. No, I, we're just recapping, just to introduce it. No, because I think that you're collapsing the third one with the second one. So I, I asked Mattia to redo the <clears throat> second one. So the end of the first paragraph on page 77 reads, the principle of identity has the formula A equals A. The principle of contradiction states A is not equal, is this, I am the two horizontal line plus a slash, not A, so A is different than not A. The principle of the excluded middle require X is either A or not A. Did you get that? Yeah. Okay, but it can't be both and it can't be neither. Or it cannot be a third thing either. That's what I mean, yeah. it can't be both and yeah. it can't be either. Neither. Um, did you get that? I've written it down. <laughs> okay, now, okay, that's a, that's that's a step. When you, when you, in geometry, <laughs> you state that the point is the infinitesimal amount you can think of. The line is a sequence of points. Okay. Two parallels along leading to infinity. These, these, these tenets that are the tools you use to develop all the rest of the discipline. These are axioms. You right. don't need to demonstrate them. You almost take them on the basis of faith. Okay. And the problem that Heidegger addresses is not only him. Actually, it's well that Heidegger was born the same year as Wittgenstein, and he developed very parallel algorithms, which is quite interesting. Um, is that when you, the problem of Heidegger is that when you start uh, discussing these principles and trying to explain them or demonstrate them, you're already putting them into use. Okay. So there is a vicious circle in the tradition that states something that this has to take as a given. Or if it wants to explore it, it cannot. Because immediately it, it uses it. It puts something from the top of it in between the mind of things and this concept. And it, it never reaches it fully. So it, the, the, the problem is con immediately conceived, immediately covered up. Um, as in, uh, you go around with a photographic camera, uh, and I think very often if you want to photograph people, they notice you, and they are not natural. And you can't avoid it. The, the camera in between mm -hmm. acts this transformation, this bridge. this bridge, which is a bridge that mm -hmm. hopes to link but actually keeps apart. And so it's the excluded middle. Okay. Does that makes nice. sense? Okay. And that's, Thank you. That's, <laughs> that's, that's that what one. language does. That's a problem of the problematic of language that it ends up inevitably to be not a language. It picks up something, and when you want to explain it, you have to use the same tool, and you just hit your feet with it. You hit your foot with the hammer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, there is circular. Right? Come, it falls back onto you, mm -hmm. or onto you know, it. So it, this is the first problem he finds. And Did I, you get that, Barnaby? Yeah. Did you get that, Dane? Lauren? Yeah. Okay. And it's as an expression or a consequence um, of this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Looking into, you're looking to the middle distance. So I'm wondering <laughs> if you actually really did get that. I was. Um, when we, it's, it's, uh, when we speak about language like this, we, we mean about, we talk about a, a written language. What Whereas is language a, a, here? a language that is not written would be different in its kind of. It's, 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 it's communication. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the best way of putting that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Pardon me. I just want to mention that. That, that's <laughs> I wish we could just do a freeze frame of you. <laughs> and you. And you cannot enjoy the fantastic magic egg. <laughs> Which. <laughs> Which is not working. <laughs> it's already, no it's, idea. it's okay. already broken. Um, Sorry, go on. So what? You, what can I say? About the egg. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, it's reducing language to like alphabetic sign and communication as, as opposed to. It's related really language to a medium, something that carries a meaning. Oh. Okay, yeah. So all of that, I guess that seems to this like, so like all communication and language and, and all that. That's right, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So that's sort of um, mimetic <laughs> language or a language of <laughs> yeah. language. Don't think of language as a system of words or words. Think of language as any kind of meaning. Or something understood as a carrier of meaning. So it can be very visual, it can be photographs, it can be drawings, it can be anything. it can be the project of for a building. Just carry on this nothing. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Okay. Um, 
So Sorry. the way I then understand the lecture two, again to sum it up, is that this problem of something in between is then repeated and amplified in the in projecting a subject and an object as existing apart before it's object. And then something will bridge them, namely language. Or a subject and not a subject. Go on. Um, I'm sorry, I know this is a little tiny bit distracting. And, um, and then it goes on explaining that this is what uh, um, idealism has developed to the, full, to the fullest. And he thinks that that's at the same time the highest uh, pinnacle of thought until then, but entirely wrong. Sorry. And then it starts again from the principle of identity as the basic principle of thought. So I'll just Sorry. Ask that. I feel like I'm destroying your discussion here. Did you just go with that, your point two? Then that this says that this this issue of language being in between is um, explained and amplified by the understanding of subject and object of uh, classic. When I say classic, it's not sorry, modern uh, from Cartesian to the Cartesian to the, in the 19th century that poses them or projects them as. Uh, he uses here a one of the three specific um, composition of representation Borstal, which is the place in front of a proper projection. Um, projection as existing as separated and then interrupting, or then bridged by language. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, more, it's enough of the point. Okay. Oh, I forgot to put this in. That's why it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Never mind. Okay, it's sorry. It's a proper philosophical problem. It's how the, how the <laughs> basic concept. The interiority is guilty. Um, and, and he says that dialectics has found that the, un the mediated unity of, of these separated items has been is synthetic and has been identified with identity. That's what identity was supposed to be. And this is what, what does it mean to say that it's synthetic? It means that the, the, the it's not, it, it, it uses a sort of the expression of a bland, flat unity as now Obviously, identity is not that, it's not an indistinguished continuity of solid matter. Right, that's important. So, identity is not an indistinguished homogeneity, an indistinguished mass. Of, of common denominators, right? Yes. Okay. But also, I mean, it's funny because the way he, he, uh, all the etymologies of Heidegger have been debated apparently to a great extent because he's very, very creative, if not even entirely wrong at times in the way he uses etymology. And he also he bends a lot. The quotes he takes from uh, Parmenides is quite selective. For selective because the most important quote of Parmenides is being he is, non being is not. So Parmenides actually posits that what he is, he is continuous, solid, without differences, and if you put difference in it, he is hell because then differences will be everywhere and you would never reach the next bit of being and everything will break, break apart. Did everybody get that? That's part of Zeno's paradox. Yes. Yeah. So can you explain that again? So why, why would inserting difference everywhere? So Parmenides is argument, really, is that being is and not being isn't, is and not. Is not. And it ends there. Yeah. And what Heidegger does is basically join those two phrases together. So he says being is and, and not being is not being. And together you have the whole picture. But the picture itself is still not a dialectical picture. It's a picture of identity that must always already have difference within it. Hence the, the basis of Guido's arguments about uncertainty. That makes sense to you? Okay. And is a, is a uh, situation, I, cannot, I don't want to put a solution, that does not have the unity that dialectics wanted. Because dialectic concludes bit step by step, and, and instead in consecutive steps. And for Heidegger, instead, uh, the way I understand it is the difference. There are in different steps. There is the same happening constantly. The 
to a degree, because you know, in the end it causes singular tantum, to a degree that singular tantum. It, it, it's um, it's not even um, it is repeating itself to to such an extent that it is almost beyond the vibration. I believe it uses vibration in in this version, but um, it is something that is always on coming. You know, the world is always being. Uh, coming into, into existence. It's a bit, as it, logically, the Big Bang is always Big Banging. Um, so it's, it starts from, from, from this point and reanalyzes the, the, the principle of identity. So if, mm -hmm. the, if the Big Bang, or mm -hmm. to, to put it this mm -hmm. way, or if, um, if something were always coming forth, because that's what he's actually mentioned, he's yeah. mentioning something comes forth. Is the coming forth this interiority that was being suggested earlier? Um, that I'm not sure. I, so wh I, where does interiority and exteriority fit in this in this paradigm so far? Um, well. As long as, I mean, obviously it is a visual or, or, or physical uh, model or metaphor, where people can draw it similarly. The issue of um, two spaces, at least, uh, to me is in Heidegger, in the that we are reading, because he speaks of the historic world uh, that has been until now organized by metaphysics. Um, the world has its own image. And um, these or the world of technology where things are distributed in a specific way and uh, therefore there are specific dimensions. The event of appropriation you, you, you addressed or you, you have before um, is, the, is appropriating not simply or not in the way where one thinks that I on one side of this relationship appropriate the other side. But it's where humans and beings are becoming proper to themselves. Each of the two players, if you like, if you want to keep on to two, um, does what it what belongs to it. I do what I am supposed to do, what I was always meant to do, what is more intrinsically me. I'm not taking from you something to become fully me. Does it make any sense? No. Yeah, I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> I'm just doing that. I don't. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I relate this very much to, to artistic practices. Or to <laughs> other. Um, if one can make an example a bit to the side, have you, you know, if one is familiar with Benjamin's analysis of the, the cinema and photography? Which part of it? The, the mechanical reproducibility. No, but what part of it? Oh, the, the, the mechanical reproducibility of art. Well, the, what are you saying that? <coughs> Um, these uh, media are still used as tools that represent an existing ideology. So they are used for to create diversion, entertaining, or, or for carrying the existing values of the cultural political class that is ruling the society. And he's saying that if you would look at these media, uh, with these technologies properly, you would see that they can do something else. And that's what really belongs to them as a real property. Okay. They can be, they cannot, uh, they go beyond the contemplation of one-to-one -one that traditional art had. They would induce a more collective um, way of experiencing and enjoyment and production. Therefore, they would permit radical revolutionary changes in society. What Heidegger is saying to me when he, in this world of property, appropriation, properly, it's precisely this, that there is an element of, of um, um, representation over things that covers with the pre-existing image something and doesn't let it be what it is. Um, and this is where it comes from phenomenology that try to do away with essences that would be preconceived and see what reality was really in itself. So in other words, Another way of saying that is that reality doesn't have an essence or even a sus substance in the way that Hegel would be suggesting. 
but that that doesn't make it any less real. It doesn't make it any less stable. It doesn't make it any less knowable. Mm -hmm. And that you can know that something's a tree and that this, while possibly made out of a tree, is not a tree, even if it has properties of a tree. So what, what Heidegger is trying to talk about, trying to suggest, is how does something get its meaning if you're not going to go, first of all, to a concept that is giving it its meaning? Again, that was why I was giving you a hard time, Barnaby, because I was worrying that you were putting forward a concept like without letting the situation speak, as it were, without it, without it itself making its, um, its presence present, it presenting itself. And I found it interesting, uh, Di, in your uh, remark that you, you ended up with metaphor as a, as a question or as a, as a possible scenario. Because I think that there are a lot of people who would actually say that metaphor would be the condition around which one can solve the Heideggerian move and hence get into semiotics, um, which he would, of course, get mad at. But I thought it was quite smart that you figured out that that was, in fact, a possibility. But that's exactly it. where he throws his um, head. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, where he says, well, I, actually, I am not, I've not so passed the metaphor. I'm still on the metaphor. I think, uh, yeah. And um, Mattia, just to repeat what he said. <laughs> sorry right. to uh, startle you. Could, 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 <laughs> so, could, 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 could repeat what you just said. That, I believe that this is where Heidegger, um, at the end, believes he has failed in his project. Because he still, he still sees that thought. Philosophy, he says it somewhere in here as well. Philosophy is the bridge between humans and being, and he cannot go past, or cannot do away with the bridge and, and find, um, yes, indeed, what he calls the more authentic relationship. He yeah. keeps falling back into it, into having to use a bridge of one sort or another. Um, Did you get that? Yeah. There is but, a, a relate that to, you related that to metaphor in yeah because he says well we are still we sorry. are still forced to use a metaphor we cannot name things directly we cannot touch them directly so in other words in his leaping back and forth these are all uh, well that's not exactly a metaphor but it's um, it's set up so that it's not it's not an analytic category the idea of springing back springing forward and so on. Anyway, go on. Me? Okay. Yeah. Um, Does that, did that answer your question, Barbie? Yeah. <coughs> so then he starts an argument that at times I find very much working on a very, very, very fine line on the cliff of being <coughs> entirely circular. On top of entirely circular? Yes, and tautological. And it's, it's very, very delicate. And one has to a bit trust it, a bit follow the translation, keep playing with the glossary because. Yeah, the glossary is great. But the, the glossary is very, very helpful here. Um, and uh, <coughs> so the, the first thing was already, well, you, you worked it up already, that there, there is a paradigmatic shift between thinking that um, <coughs> being exists and has identity as character and being not being such a totalitarian concept but actually existing in identity. And how do you mean that then? What do you mean by totalitarian? Like totalizing? Totalizing. I mean also right. because it, it, it speaks of, uh, in this lecture is better than in the, the, the newer version that identity and difference because he very quickly shifts from speaking of being with a capital B and being with a small b. Yeah. Uh, and speaks of being active with a small b as a verb of the, the, the infinity of existence and humans being in history. Mm -hmm. So it becomes much, much more clear uh, what he's talking about. Um, and um, but then he shifts the, the, the problem because is is not as I was saying earlier is not the opposite of um, identity being a property of being or of the being, um, but he, he, he relaunches his argument with the causal harmonic that being and thinking belong to the same. 
So he basically then rewrites Parmenides. Yes, you know, it, 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 first he goes via Plato, uh, Plato uh, quoting the, the, each in itself is the same to itself, eh? and then he goes from that, jumps to Parmenides, um, saying that in the same name, Leo, the same indeed, is thinking as well as also being. And, and why does that work? Why does that, I mean, because what Dai brought up correctly was the problem that in order to access identity, you have to be in it, but if you're in it, then you're going to use the same tools. Mm -hmm. And if you're using the same tools, then you're going to be hypostatizing it, so you're going to be out of it. Mm -hmm. So how does that solve the problem? How, how does that technically allow him to talk about language without bringing in the problems of language? How does, how does that work? Uh, it's, I think it's a bit more than simply complex. Uh, one really needs to, to follow his text as a poem to, to to make it um, make sense. Um, the first thing that he, he, he points out, it's still in his critique of it, the principle of identity, to me, is that he speaks of uh, how we are listening to this to the statement of the principle. When we say a equals a, we're actually saying a, this a here, is this a over here, and he wants to focus on the is in between the metaphoric language. Um, so then he says. The principle speaks of the is, how every being is, namely it itself, the same with itself. The principle of identity speaks of the being of beings, or of the being of humans at this point. Um, I will say later why humans are not animal or other things in nature. As a law of thinking, the principle only holds insofar as it is a law of being. So he is shifting by playing. This one I said before that no, it, it's always on the border with tautology or with mm, circular thinking because by, by almost by a rhetoric device is shifting the, the, the attention here from identity as it was understood beforehand to being and before then it's allowed to flip the, the problem not into its opposite but into the relation. Um, Can can someone translate that? Anybody want to translate that? Because I want to make sure you're hearing what Mattia is saying. Barnaby, you want to try it? No, no, thank you. Lauren? Um, I thought, I thought that, um, he's quite interested in um, that bit where he's still making a distinction, distinction of like kind of two or one um, in relation to sort of. Um, you mean, so, so like, two A's versus one A? Yeah, so it's like the formula names and equivalents of A and A to an equation that belongs at least to. And then in contrast, um, uh, then he's up there saying that in contrast to that uh, sort of tautology, um, uh, for something to be able to be the same, one is enough. Um, but so I think, I thought what he was maybe saying is those two distinctions you say should be like, yeah, he's A. Um, but rather, you said the emphasis of a, and in italics, it's a, where mm -hmm. he's making a metaphor. I thought perhaps it's like the first a, a it, it, that's where the, it, <coughs> the law behind that is that there's two, and whereas in the second sense, there's one. So, what, in what sense is this is there? And so, that's a very good point. Sorry, can, I, I, can, can I show you with apples here? Okay, so you have two, you have A is A. So even though these are different in the sense that they're not literally, they don't have the same shape exactly, you're going to say that this apple and this apple are the same thing in as much as they are apple. But now Hegel would say, no, the only reason you can say they're the same is because we have concept of apple, which allows you to then say that these two apples are the same. And what Heidegger is saying, no, he's saying that these two apples belong together and therefore they're the same. But you can take this one away and say that this apple is it's a, is an apple. You don't need this other apple to say it. So he's saying you don't need to have this belong to this greater category called the apple. You're going to have a singularity as a category. Yeah? You see? One, but one thing is a category. But one is a category and so you still need, so he still hasn't gotten out of the Heideggerian, pardon me, the Hegelian better solution as it were. Because Hegel is saying, look, that's all well and good, but you're not going to be able to do anything with this. Mm -hmm. 
So even if you take this away and you have the one A is A, this, this is itself, it's still not telling you anything. Then you have a total, tautology. So at least at this level, these two things belong together. So you can say that the thing that pulls them together, the equal sign that belongs together, these two things, that thing in there, that belonging, is the is that he's commenting on. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps these two together. But now he says, what happens if we just have, if I say to you, do you want this because this is an apple? This is an apple, do you want this apple? So he's, he's talking about this belonging to something. It's just not belonging to its, this, this level of the identity. So the question is, what is it, what's the singularity that it's belonging to? Now obviously you might want to say, well, it's belonging to fruit, or it's belonging to an apple, or one, and we're back to Hegel again. So he doesn't defeat Hegel on that particular move. It doesn't because in the end, although it doesn't compare apple to apple, it takes yes. one apple away, but still need appleness. Appleness. So appleness <coughs> it doesn't need to be here, it's transcendental, but so he doesn't escape it. Yeah. So how does he solve that? Well, it solves it by uh, repositioning the problem not as, a, as opposites, mm -hmm. which would still be A equals A, if that you put them together. What is an apple? But apple is the definition of apple. That long book on, on, on the doctrine of biology, whatever. And then you have the fruit. You know what it is. It, it, it just so that's not solving it. No, that, it drops that. So you're thinking, your lecturers are right. Why am I studying Heidegger? He's a lunatic. And then, and then he goes, it, it, it pulls up this, this quote from, uh, from Parmenide, where he's actually comparing, not apple to apple, but apple to cash, being and thinking about the same. Is this, is this what he calls self-similarity? No. no. Okay. Um, and he relaunches the argument from something that, you know, it's radically different than Hegel, certainly. Um, so we have, okay, so in this situation where the tangerine, or whatever it's Clementine, no, the tangerine, is, let's say, Dasein, big B being, and this is little A being, mm -hmm. I mean, you know what I mean, little apple, I mean, little being, that they belong together, mm -hmm. he's saying, all right. But in this case, where you have A is A, so they're saying little being, entity and little being entity belong together, I mean, are the same. Mm -hmm. So one is same, 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 but different. Okay. Now, the difference still belongs to the same because they're able, because they... Can I just stop you then? But why then, if they belong to the same, are they not, what, why is it different? Why are they, why, how come he keeps saying, Hegel, you're a bad person, and we don't like you any longer, and I want to have your fame. Why does he, why is he actually, sort of, why is this breaking the Hegelian mood? Because it seems like he's just confirming well, to me, it. The, it does. It seems like he's confirming it. Um, he's confirming, well. But he's not. But to me, he's not. What is, not to you, he's not. He's not. <laughs> to me, what he's doing is describe, to make an example, uh, the, to me, it's um, works better than, than apples and tangerines. Um, is the relationship we have with language. Language is not, <coughs> the all of English is not in any of us' mind in its entirety. We use it, but it's not in our brain. But it's nowhere else either. If we don't find English in if we get the biggest dictionary of English, it's not all there. English exists in the circulation among all the English speakers and the literature and advertising and wherever there is some English written or spoken or thought, there it is, but there can be more. It's not exhausted in the use we have and it doesn't reside in words. Now, this could be a description of what is transcendental, but it is a description of what is transcendental, but at the same time, if we take speaking English away and we replace it with being, existing, existence, the problem is, is, to me, is the same. So he's trying to find a, a way of defining my presence here now in history uh, as not arbitrary, but not needing the dialectical totalitarian conclusion. 
um, because that conclusion would be based on those axioms of thought that they showed were self-referring. Did anybody get that? Say a little closer anyway. <laughs> so take language away and and replace it with being existence. or existence, yeah? I, I exist. I exist, yeah. In existing, I participate of the notion of existence. I enjoy that thing. I don't know if these are all sort of logic expressions, but um, that helps <coughs> I little things to give um, What, you know, but why, 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 why should, should try to solve it? Um, to, to give a, a, a cohesion, a solidity to one's existence, in obviously in logical terms, without needing the, uh, the equation of, the, of A is A, uh, of the dialectical move, because that, yes, is conclusive, but is based on principles that are unfortunately axioms. They are not demonstrable. They are not provable. They can be used, they work perfectly, but the one wants to look inside them. That's where the thing rests. Why is dialectic moving this way? Because it needs to reach its own end. And that's all one can say about it. This is the way I understood the problem. Okay, but, how, but I guess my question is how does he get out of a, the A equals A? As a, as a, I mean, the solution that Hegel comes up with is far more elegant and, in fact, works better than the way Heidegger explains A equals A, or at least the way he's explaining it. Because it doesn't, it's not, it, it, what he is after at this point, to me, is no longer um, A equals A, which is uh, comparing A with its definition, you know, with the, the apple and the full description of what the apple is, whether the apple is reality and the description is language or vice versa. Right, okay, good. Um, but he speaks of, he, he proposes instead a relation where two different things are the same because they would not have any existence separated. That's so important. Do people get that? Which is the relation? Yeah. Dasein and, well, and how, how come they would have no relation? See, like, for example, maybe with what Barnaby's saying is that guilt and interiority are the same. Or in that this sense, are you can't exist well, outside of each other. Speaking of guilt, and since we are so in such a... The papacy. A, a, the papacy We're going to go back to the papacy, aren't we? There would be no salvation without guilt. The whole edifice of the church and the religion rests upon I'm saving you because you're guilty. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and the two things exist together. They, we perceive in the daily chapter that we wonderful to live without guilt. But if you take that away, as you see, we're still in the, in the, in the um, paradise, I don't know what it's called, the, the, in the Eden. But at the same time, you wouldn't be humanity as we know, it's just something else. Um, all the organization of culture as we have it would not have happened. So the two need to, <coughs> not even need to be together, as they are together, give rise to the organization. Right, that's a better way of putting it. So as they are linked, yeah. X, Y, and Z follow. There is no need for them to be together, but because but they are together. he's not saying that about being and, 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 and little being. He's saying that they need to be together. Yes, there, there is, that, that's, uh, it's not directly here, but he's trying somewhere else about the destiny of all these, which, to me, is a bit strange. Yeah, because there's the to, authenticity. Problem. To resort to, there is still a third element in his argument in the end. Um, yeah, so he's still, you're saying he doesn't get away from Hegel. I, I don't know it enough. I mean, I should be reading, um, being a time where this is positive and all the things, were, but there, there is an element of, of the destiny, the call that the humans feel from being, and vice versa, that they the provoking being in the presence from the human. As long as it is done from the two sides, it works. But sometimes when it speaks of destiny, I think that at least it remains unclear. If it is destiny as it resounds here and there, it, it is literally a third element outside the game of humans and beings or essence. So then it, uh, it well, would well, not let's go back. Sorry to mm. I interrupted before because I think I got you off the wrong track. But if you can maybe go over that paragraph again that you were just 
exciting. Um, Which page are you on, by the way? 110. One hundred and what, sorry? One hundred and ten. One one zero. Okay, at the top of the page it says even the improved formulation A is A, only an absolute identity comes to the form comes to the form. Henceforth, this much is clear. The principle of identity tells us nothing about identity. Presumably it does not even claim to tell us as such. To tell us as such. It is held to be the highest law of thought. As law, we hear in this word, uh, like our mountain range, it's, it's law is a good sense, and then mountain range is Gerberg, and it starts with the dependent words here. And as law, the principle of identity gathers all the positing of all the statements in an authoritative way. Why? So this is what he is after to me. He wants to find a law that posits, that gathers all the positings, positing of all the statements. So all, all, all the logic, and all it is, and, and all this logic is, uh, all the um, instances, all the, the um, applications of this logic, are held together by one law, uh, in an authoritative way. So things stay together without arbitrarily. They, they, they stay together with an organization. Which one, if it is? And which is that? Uh, is this belonging, relation of belonging that he proposes progressively in, in his lecture? Proposes. Right, okay, so, <coughs> so basically, let's talk about identity as um, who am I? What, who are you? Rather than, um, I mean, I want to I bring it into this kind of almost emotive thing where you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, who am I? Or where you are ill and you think you might be dying and you think, who, who have I been? Who is this person? So this is the level of identity I want you to start thinking about rather than, <laughs> than whether these things belong to each other or not. You know, because he's getting to the question of how does one, not assign meaning, but how does one live meaning? In the, the following part, okay. starts, you see that again, it's very important, although then it sort of yeah. tapers off. Um, we hear the standard when we attend to the tonic pitch of the principle of identity, and accordingly, emphasize this formulation, no longer on A is A, but rather on A is A. What, now, what do we hear? And here it starts, it's out. Yeah, so, uh, so just, to, just to preface that again, if, I mean, I'm gonna take it to, I, for anybody who's been in a relationship, let's say you're in love with somebody, or whatever the situation is, you're in a relationship with, you know, with, you're in love with them, or you're with your parents, or your kids, or whatever it is, and they do something very odd, wrong, let's say, let's say ethically, morally, bizarrely wrong, and you look at that person and you say, who are you? I thought I knew you. Who are you? He's gonna get this kind of, what makes you the you that you are? The one that you thought you knew, that sitting, that you sleep with every night, or that you have, you know, whatever, whatever you've been brought up with, or whatever the story is. How does one get to that level of identity? I could say, you know, Johnny is, you know, blonde hair, you know, glasses, you know, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. You would get no closer to who is Johnny. Who are you? This is what's going on. Here. Is it the, in that case, isn't it the circumstance that gives rise to, um, I mean, it gives rise to but the question. But it's more than circumstance. Place. It's more than that. It's more than just circumstance is constituting or is building the who are you. It's that the way in which the you as entity, let's say, is attracted to the Dasein and how the Dasein is brought into yourself. So that, let's say, uh, let's think you little walnut half. And this is the Dawes line over here. So it's how this is pulled into you and how you are pulled into the Dawes line that actually creates the distance that doesn't close up. Because if it closed up, that would beat it for you. You know, the Dawes line, if there wasn't any, um, you know, if there wasn't anything left, if there wasn't any way to keep that apart, that Dawes line apart, 
that's it for you. Okay, so somehow the somehow there is a way in which this is kept apart, but a way in which it's brought together that cur that begins to build, assemble who this identity of the you is, and that building is what he's calling an event of appropriation, which is where we began. So what creates that thing that both pulls it together and keeps it apart, that's the event. It pulls and pushes at the same time. Except I'm saying pulls and pushes. No, but it's fine to say pull and pushes because um, What's that? it's fine to say pull and pushes because there is a lot of creating space. But what I mean, what, what is not good about saying pulls and pushes is that it sounds linear. When in fact he's talking dimensionally, which is another whole world that we're not even entering in yet. But just so, um, so just so you have a sense that somehow if you are going to remain with an identity, you can't have that happen. That cannot happen also because um, um, the, the, the reason why I read this last sentence, you right? mentioned on the pitch, yeah. around. So he, he's, he's speaking here about a way of listening rather than a way of applying the definition. Right, and it's the listening or the hearing that Barnaby had mentioned. Yes. And, um, so th there is a, a need for opening up rather than closing down the subject as a completely defined uh, unit that then becomes active into a wider environment. Um, it, it, and and one, the, the, all, the, the maximum activity to be that Heidegger uh, unspeakates is the one of opening and allowing things to come to life. Mm -hmm. Not to grasp things, not to take. So they're coming forth. Yes. But he did, he's not saying you should be sitting in a field waiting for yourself to be found, no, or no, like no, the no, celebrity no. that finds you, you're looking around and America's Next Top Model spots you. And no, takes he's you. saying that, jumping ahead, that this uh, opening is actually a recognition of precisely what we really are, but it needs to be. Um, is, is not in here. It, it comes up a bit in the, at the end of the second lecture where he speaks of um, ab the ability to die is what is proper to us and therefore um, uh, our finitude is what is more proper. And if there is an element of uh, the relationship between the finitude of human beings versus the infinity, not eternal immortality of some sort of God, but the infinity of existence that keeps coming to presence and as such creates the distance which gives us meaning that we are relating to that infinity of existence from the point of view of finite existence. And this limit is the meaning that, that we have according to what is right here. And actually it's interesting because it says um, blah, 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 uh, on page 107, um, let us note it well, it is the mortal who reach sooner into the abyss, therefore they are the ones who dwell in the refuge of death and are those thus able to die. An animal cannot die, it comes to an end. Which I don't agree with. No, right? obviously not, but he's <laughs> speaking of, um, um, is because he's identifying being with thinking and he's excluding animals from thinking, they cannot enter this relational mode of existence. But anything that cannot think, whether it's an animal mm -hmm. or a human or whatever, he would say would enter, would en would just end. Yes. Now, hence the problem of the sort of fascistic moment, because if you can reduce people or things no, to bugs, no. yeah. let's say, then. Um, to me, it's the, the, there are two elements that might be even in these post-war lectures to, to a very right-wing position. One is this, which is more logical, and the other one seeps through the examples he makes. Mm -hmm. well, especially when he speaks about technology, um, he's, and he says that modern technology sees the world as a standing reserve, something that is there for something else to be consumed, and not for what it is. The examples he brings against it are always the old days. Mm -hmm. The they farmer, so the, the man in the woods, the river without the water dam for making electricity. So he was reducing something that should be a logical environment to what he has seen when he was young and therefore was supposed to be authentic and true. 
it is even disregarding what happened before his time. Yeah. So this closing down of, I've seen that one, that is solidifying the truth, the rest is wrong. He is, to me, the first mentality of the right in position. Yeah. Uh, just as a parenthesis, uh, I was I was mentioning this earlier to Matilda when we were having lunch. I was uh, talking with some people about uh, MIT has developed a bot, uh, which they, it's, it's um, no, sorry, that, that's two things. I was not, actually, something to put. There's a uh, there's a question about drones and the relationship of of uh, what's called the drone brain, which is what MIT has developed. And um, the the question becomes whether or not um, everything becomes this fodder for the drone, uh, which is the standing reserve. And one of the things that is the military term which is something like, um, oh yeah, the, the military term for people who are killed via drones is uh, bug splatter, which is shocking <coughs> when you think about it, but yet not shocking. Uh, and I get, I hear that when I'm reading Heidegger. What, if, if, if you don't fall into the authenticity thing, then something can just come to an end. It can be just but, blood, uh, bug splatter, that's, that's ending as opposed to a person dying, or something like that, or people dying, or civilians, or what, even military, or whatever the story is. And I, I bring that to your attention in this context here, because there's something that, there's something very important that I really want you to grasp in this complexity around how he's thinking about how meaning gets stabilized, let's say. It gets made into a stable, like a horse stable. It stabilizes, it's brought into it surrounding, it's brought to a dwelling. And then yet, at the same time, if one falls outside of thinking, then as he properly said, or has, as Mattia has properly pointed out, what gets established is that things just end, like at the end of the hour, or the end of the seminar. You just go off and do your thing, and just, or whatever. So the ethicality of what he's producing needs to, at some point, we'll address that. But I want, I want you to, to, to at least be aware that there's a different method that he is bringing to the table here. And this method actually underwrites a lot of art. I would say all art, actually. I would say this is the method of art, which is why I ask people to read this and to get in, get get down and dirty with Heidegger because, unfortunately, it is the method. Or it's the closest we've got to something that shows that there's this kind of method. And the question is, can one deal with this without becoming this right-wing Heideggerian? Um, now, obviously, Foucault tried. That's why his uh, technology of the self is very Heideggerian. Derrida, they're all Heideggerians at some level. Uh, Leotard, all of them come from this this sort of little, this, this, this engagement with these kind of texts. Um, I think with the exception of Bataille, I don't think he's dealing with Paul Heidegger on this, um, but he's coming at it from a, from a different uh, set. So the question that is being asked of you, really, the reason we're painfully going through this is to get a sense of what does it mean when you get rid of Kronos, when you get rid of a linear, uh, understanding of time, how that disrupts, and then may or may not help, but I have a feeling it helps, consider one's own work and position with respect to art. Because that, to me, is what the game is about. There's a bigger game about democracy and <coughs> ethics and so on and so forth, but there's at least this game that I want you to get a sense of. And that's why I keep trying to bring it back to, okay, we're doing this, and it looks all very nice and pretty, and it does kind of work. And then what happens when, you know, when we're talking about, like, for example, that the entity to try and, and pull Dasein over and the entity take over, it, it, it's, it doesn't work in the Heideggerian move. What, the only thing that can happen is that the, um, that the Dasein would envelop the entity, and therefore it would be nothing. But let's say, on some level, that this could envelop the Dasein, which it can't. Uh, but even if it could, it would still become nothing. 
But because it can't, what he's developed with Dasein is the notion of the singularity. That's what I'm trying to get at here. And this is a, so this operates this way, but this doesn't operate this way. So even though he has an equal sign set up, it's a belonging sign. It doesn't really mean they're equal to each other. Some things are equal, but some things are more equal than others. The, the, this has this kind of power, but this does not have, you know, smash the apple up power. This, this, so and, and this has a singular, this that's only goes in the one direction, and that direction is not linear. That's what I'm trying to get at. Singularities are not linear. They have, a, they have no sides to them. They, they have no multiple to them. It's gravitational. It's well, you could say it's gravitational, but I'm just saying, it's, what I'm, I'm asking you to think, something that doesn't have an embodiment that allows you to call it something other than a, a plane or a, or a dimension. What are you going to say? I'm thinking how elements are working together in an art piece. Okay. Do you want to pick out an art piece? I've got plenty here. Um, Actually, we have no art piece there. <laughs> no, any of them. I mean, they, they, how it is impossible and meaningless to try to separate one part of um, the, the, this poster. One cannot say that it doesn't make any sense to think of it without the positive smaller image and the negative of the bigger image. Mm -hmm. That it would be something else. And in, in, some, in, in, in another lecture, in this version, one of the states the difference between different, uh, the opposition and difference. Mm -hmm. Difference is much bigger and stronger than opposition. Yes. Uh, because it, it, just, it says it's something entirely different, it's else. It's else. And opposition is A or not A, and the difference And what's is contradiction? Contradiction is A is not A. Is not A, A. right. And difference is that it's A versus infinity. Right. And this is A, and the other options are infin infinite. So right. that's why all that is on that poster, including the fact that it's crumpled, belongs together into the poster. Right. That's the way I understand it. This is why, to me, it is directly a, a, a logical part. Right. Um, I don't, I don't so it explains how something has a belonging that makes it cohere. Yes. And this is why all semiotics. Uh, or, or the readings of art, or all ideas that there could be a theory of art, all these things are religion. It's not elegant, but that's what it is. <laughs> you don't really have a position on it. So. No, so what, can you expand again why that would be bullshit? Why, that, because, why, why doesn't that work? Why, why is there no such thing as a theory of art in that sense? Because you cannot, they two don't exist separately. What am I doing? And the reason why I'm doing it, and the, the history of the concept and objects I am using, and my history, and whatever else participates into one piece of work, uh, works in a reciprocal uh, relationship, a reciprocal feedback loop between several elements, not only two, that enhance each other simultaneously constantly rearranging themselves until, until they stop. Because I, one of the parts of the art piece, I'm not the separating author, if I stop working, and it's likely that the others also will grind down. But then not because the public can afford to it, or if, depending on the things I'm working with, they might still produce other, uh, other elements. That colors drying change. Um, mm -hmm. I can make pieces that are ephemeral, so they decay. It depends, not so dark, it depends on the past. Um, and this is precisely this, this uh, belonging, this cohesion. Here, if he puts it as, as a, a dynamic between two poles that exist only when they are together, they don't exist as separate, but there are actually multiple poles in this game. Okay, yeah. At least in, in artistic terms. Um, when, when he plays it like this, so much related to language. Hopefully, it's much simpler to keep it between two elements, like humans and the ink, and then humans, but then humans are not only one. But, um, so, in, in this way, to me, it speaks of uh, artistic logic. Uh, 
uh, I'm not saying that I think like this when I walk. I, yeah. But if I if I have to explain how artistic meaning uh, holds together, I think that this is quite a very good explanation. And I think that the old notion of horizon comes straight out of here. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Where are we so far? How are we doing for time? Oh, good shape. Okay. Well, well, we've been jumping back and forth. No, we're not yeah. following the lecture linear. So, um, uh, so he explained this this passage from the equal to the ease to how we listen to the ease, and the fact that these there must be a law that organizes the, the way that these two items around the, the, the question stay together, and um, and then he enters in the in the mm. rather easy argument about how do we understand belonging together. On the, the together of the belong. And it says a Christian. Think of the together. Um, sorry, now I would like you to point out another thing before I. Um, from, from listening to the ease, then he makes what could be an arbitrary move um, where he, he resorts to permanent. Right. Because there is no logic. He's just saying, well, this is the, the origin. Before all the problems started, the first claim moves. These are permitted. Let's start again from there. Fine, but it's the least uh, uh, ground yeah, yeah, yeah. of his passages. And um, <clears throat> and then from there, I says, okay, thinking and being belonging to the same. Uh, we leave that uh, same dark for the moment. We, um, we, we hear how this uh, belonging together rings to us. And he says, if, if, we, if we concentrate on the together, it means we are presupposing Two elements, subject and object, uh, subject and language, or language and language, however you want to put it, existing as separate and then interacting, and then brought together in the unity, and that's the tradition that has led to dialectics. If instead we concentrate on the belonging, something radical is what happens. Mm -hmm. And this is where the shift uh, that is proposing takes place. Um, Are you following this? Kind of. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. You sure? Yeah. Um, <coughs> Samara, you following us? Liar. <laughs> sure. You have a pain in your stomach. Ah, I knew there was something the matter. Would you like some water? No. You sure you're all right? Okay. You have a pain in your stomach, irrespective of Heidegger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, or is it Heidegger? Okay. okay. Um, and then he says, um, you're going to be okay, you want an apple? Okay. Go on. Um, if I shall read the paragraph because it's where he's introducing the total of belonging that I think is important. And this belonging together, however, can also be thought as belonging together. This signifies that together is first defined by the belonging. Nevertheless, it still remains to be inquired here what belonging means and how first um, from uh, from this the together proper to it is the term. So uh, it's page 112, mm -hmm. second from the last paragraph. Nevertheless, it, it still remains to be inquired here what belonging means and how first from these the together proper to it is determined. And I would like to point to this proper. How the together proper to it is determined. Um, the answer lies closest to us than we imagine. Than we imagine. Um, but it does not lie at hand. Um, it is enough for now, by means of this reference, we know the possibility of no longer thinking belonging, belonging in terms of the unity of our together, but rather thinking of this together from belonging. Okay, um, did, did, did people hear that? Do you want to just read that slower? Um, it is enough for now, by means of this reference, that we know the possibility of no longer thinking belonging in terms of the unity of our together, but rather of thinking this together from belonging. Now, what do you think okay. that means? Well, is this, I've just made a little belonging installation. Is this belonging installation that I've made? Can you, can you? That, that's the equivalency he starts from a grid side. Yes, okay, and now what, now what is he doing? What he's doing changes? is taking away these, yes. the equal in between. Okay. And he is creating a, a situation where if, Examples are never. Uh, okay, we'll go but ahead. think that we we will cut one slice of each apple. 
And so okay. none of the two is complete. Right. But they're not uh, one exact half either, so that if you put them together, you have one half. Right. Both are open. To each other. To each other. Right. Both are listening to each other. And in this relationship, which keeps on happening, they get their own identity, their own definition. So it's not a solid. Not at all. It's not fluid, a solid fluid bridge. and repetitive, and um, and it's not even a bridge. Because right. Well, but that's why that had to be yeah, thrown away. Um, that's precisely actually not a bridge, because a bridge would link two pre-existing items, two pre-existing shores, and is all interested in the water in between. Right. Um, so somehow they're linked together, and how is that linking happening? Well, it's not even that they what, are. I mean, what does it mean to say that you have to see it from the perspective of belonging? Because rather than being the two epochs or the two shores linked together, and I emphasize linked as the past, so they have been linked, they've been brought to a stage and then organized. The stage is made by their disposition, their distribution. And, um, whether this is one or changes can be discussed, but there isn't a space upon which this is taking place. This relationship makes space, makes the life of the day. And one, I don't know if it refers to this directly, but it came to, to my mind that the, the beginning of modern science in the, at the beginning of the 17th century, Newton, um, imagines that, yes, reality is rough and um, approximative, but we can think, or actually, in order to think, we have to project the, the rough data of reality into a realm of pure uh, shapes and numbers, uh, which are organized by the laws of physics. And we constantly refer to that, and we say, okay, we have an approximation here, but in a perfect environment, there will be no friction and, um, and no resistance from the air, a ball would fall exactly in this way. Then we have to accept that it would fall almost like that, just a bit like this, but something like that. This paradigm of a, a, a realm somewhere else of pure laws, pure behaviors, and of which these are just endless bad examples, these are our <laughs> um, but copies, uh, goes back to Plato. Is part of what is, is what is criticizing. He's saying there is no point in thinking of the laws that apply to the matter, the world is made. It would be us thinking that when the two atom clashes, somewhere in the little brain, some formula goes on. It, that's simply not happening. The formula is a representation. And what is after here is saying, well, the, the, the planets uh, go around and the water falls from the top, and we are happy because of gravity on the planet, all together, only one goal. And exactly as that has its meaning altogether, all in one. Mm -hmm. This is what to me is coming out of the belonging. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what it means to to under, to take something from so-called the perspective. I'll use that word just in a very generous sense uh, of this thing called belonging. That, that's what it, I mean. That, that wasn't a question actually. That was a rhetorical mm -hmm. remark. So you, you're just saying that the belonging. And so oh, we've lost Barnaby again. Um, so the belonging is this interiority. It's an interiority that does not have an exteriority. There is the does does not have an exteriority. Yes. That, that grounds it, where the principles have to be found. Yeah. Uh, the principles are always already in action, and always already is, a, is quite a delicate um, expression because the phrase would be the thing. The principles are in action. They don't rest on a book of theory somewhere else. Right. Indeed, at the end of page 113, jumping just a bit ahead, um, 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 is writing, obviously, the human is a kind of being. As such, it belongs to the whole of being. Belonging still means here classified under being. But as thinking, um, as the thinking being, the distinction of the human consists in his understanding the being of being, because as addressed by being, it corresponds to this. The human is this relation of correspondence. So this is what identity has become. It's not, to me, uh, the, the, my understanding is it's not a solid thing that has, is plugged in to, to the existence of humans or to be, 
that is the relation. So it's completely fluid and dynamic, and I would say changes. Yes. So what? So how does this relate to your artwork, or to any artwork, but your artwork actually? How, how do you have this thing called feedback loop in mm -hmm. your work? So how does that? You're right. This, what you're saying. I just, I, I just would like to ground this a little bit so people can actually hear it a bit more. Um, well, I, I, sometimes I see these in a very radical way when I think what I am after is really the end product of the war or what I like is spending time in the studio working. Mm -hmm. But probably speak too far from, from, from um, but what, I, what I'm saying is that I find, okay, let's make an example because otherwise it becomes to the lab stuff. I've been very, very interested in a way of working that has gone under the name of institutional criticism, um, which I interpreted a bit with relational aesthetics, always hoping to find means of upsetting order or order in various ways. Um, and it, it seemed an interesting new key. Um, then institutions in various forms stopped responding to me, so I couldn't really be active as an artist professionally. Um, because the curator that said, yes, let's show this fantastic project you have, never answered the phone. The other curator told me off. In order to show that was already organized, disappeared. Those that had published the book never replied. I started studying this um, <laughs> But I didn't give up. And one thing I'm doing now is um, misunderstanding art situations. Um, I once was inside Whitechapel in London. Whitechapel has two big arches with uh, glass doors off the roof of the street. I was next to the reception. There was somebody drunk that fell, and the ambulance came, and there was plenty of blue lights, people dressed in yellow, other people looking. So I went next to the reception desk, and I said, oh, very interesting. Who's the artist that organized the performance out there? And there was shock at the counter, and they got the camera and said, Professor, I think that has an incident, it means it's very dramatic. And I kept collecting these kind of things that are half um, um, intentional and half open to randomness because I cannot predict them. And sometimes they are genuine misunderstanding. In Milan, there is a gallery that has the building that was one side all in glass, and there are gigantic shelves with huge packs of things. They look like crystal installations. And I, the first time I went there, I entered and had a brilliant installation. Who's the artist? Well, that's our stir, so, sir. It's uh, I just storage. I just storage. I but I write it as an art piece. Mm -hmm. So I'm collecting these things, and, and to me, this is a relation of correspondence. As in, is how I am reacting to something I found that can lend itself very, very well to this reorganization. And that's the interiority that yes. has no exteriority. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the examples. That yeah, I, I can see that. Um, um, do, do other people see? It? Is, is this? You, I want to make sure that we're getting. At least two. The Barnaby, when you took a little stroll, uh, we ended up talking about interiority. Um, yeah. And one of the things about the interiority was that there was no exteriority to it, because the interiority had to do with the question of belonging, and the belonging was something uh, that was quite differently placed than the bridge that linked together, the, in this case, the two apples. Um, so that the belonging, that something, that something could be linked, but not via a bridge. The linking was because of the tonality of the, um, of the way in which they lend themselves to each other, literally lending, borrowing oneself to each other, that kind of thing, lending oneself to each other. And that lending creates this interiority. Um, and that's what you were basically saying about how you could walk upon something and think it's a piece of art, but it's actually an installation, the installation of the fact. It, it, it might happen also in, in, in the painting. You know. It's the fact that you don't, the, the reason, to, if there were an exteriority, there would be an opposite of an artist. Or there would be a formula to make the perfect art piece. To make, there would be no difference between an art piece and the perfect art piece, because there would be a formula, one applies a formula, and yes, the result. Mm -hmm. um, instead, this is not given. What the situation is, is a combination of elements, all floating and bobbing about on their own speed and intensity of rhythm, that for a while bob along 
of the same rhythm, and they make the piece. And I insist, I include myself, the artist, in the, mm -hmm. in the, um, the assemblage. And then the, sometimes I used to get very long, sometimes I break apart sooner. But that's why there isn't an exterior, because there isn't a, 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 an abstract, pure law somewhere else that they refer to. Um, you were, when we started reading Heidegger, you introduced him saying he, he, is, intro, he is introducing sorry for the um, thinking by feels rather than endpoints. Mm -hmm. um, to me, if uh, in this case, now thinking by endpoints would be thinking that there is reality and there is a level of theory, two extremes, and then they're brought together. Mm -hmm. Thinking by fields is that we're here and we are moving, we are our own vector, and there are plenty of other vectors, and all together create a tension that stays together for shorter or longer periods, but you know, a mix of it. Um, and these can, uh, can go from an art piece to the individual. He, he makes reference of quite obliquely to psychoanalysis and that's what he's doing. Um, but, um, I mean, what, what I want to just bring before we run out of time, because I want to make sure we cover this one last little bit, because this will set up the move into difference that we'll do next week, um, I think. And this is a question I asked to you and to your good self and to anybody else, that's been, and to Lauren, who uh, <coughs> presenting on um, this identity and difference thing. So you have this identity scenario. Um, and you have these events of appropriation, where this event of appropriation creates the interiority, as it were. Right? That, that's what creates the dwelling. Mm -hmm. That's what creates this kind of um, plane, as it were. Now, because you were saying if you take the apple and you chop off one little piece, and you chop off another little piece, and that their wounds, they sort of face each other, and that they, they can speak to each other. That's, that's kind of the, the way in which it's. How does one understand the edge within those elements, or the Dasein versus you know the big being and little being? How do you understand where they aren't themselves any longer, but still come together to create this thing called the interiority, the event of appropriation? How come it doesn't just become one homogeneous blob? What is it that makes it still bubbly, flowy, dynamic? What is it? Tension. Thank you, Barnaby. The tension of the um, of the belonging. Okay, so what? So, in other words, this notion of space, the spacing within these things, so that we know that these two apples, that they, like I like I was showing before, if you know, if this. You know, if, if the entity came together to the Dasein and there would not be any space left, right? That would be it, right? There'd be nothing left. They'd be all crushed. So what what is it that we know that he's not talking about literally holding apart, because that would be this bridge type thing that we're saying things flow back and forth and at the same time stay apart. Somehow they're 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 together. You're calling it intensity. Uh, that's well, I guess that's my answer my question. Is that is that thing that allows them to maintain their um, their difference from each other an intensity? No, it's yeah, it's an abyss. Okay, and so the abyss is what? What what is this abyss? Is it air? Is it space? Well, it's, it's the lack of the lack of a ground in in mm -hmm. both a literal sense and a um, and a philosophical sense. Uh, and I think that it, it provides a, if, if, you, if you take the, 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 the word literally abyss, an abyss must be, must be a space between things. Um, and I think that the abyss has its own internal logic and that's attention. Um, the only, the, the way I find it most helpful to think about this is it becomes it becomes almost like a kind of ravine if you like some sort of like mountaineer uh, shouting from one side to the other. The fact that there is an abyss means that there must be things uh, containing the abyss and a, a, a container for the abyss, and it's that which 
puts the tension into the abyss, or even if you like, the ravine. And if you could kind of think of something, somebody shouting across the uh, across that space, we might be able to think about it, that. It both puts the 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 the, tr the sound wave traveling both puts puts the the shouter into the relation with the with the other side of the, the other side of the abyss and the the kind of crossing is um is the uh, is the being is the uh, is the one of the properties of being I think for Heidegger um, it's exactly what exactly reverse to what uh, Matthias said earlier because the, you can um, well first I will start from pointing out the translation abyss is up ground so it's a known ground it's not a cut in between right. Um, but that's kind of what you meant, Barnaby. That yeah, this yeah, wasn't, yeah, yes. was, was it groundless? It was a groundless. Um, I just call it groundless. Go on. But there isn't a container outside that keeps the two shores, the two sides of the of the ravine. But I, I think there, I think there must be. It's like a kind of um, it is an implied con container, just like uh, a fragment implies a whole. Um, you can't have an abyss without... But that's precisely, you see, this is what I was going to add. The argument about the abyss is more complex than just what the abyss is, because in, in the notion of hard ground, I believe that Heidegger has at least two uh, meanings. One is that the abyss is produced by metaphysics, because by distancing reality and language, theory and practice, uh, subject and object, it needs a cut in between. And then it covers it up by synthetic processes of dialectics or other things, or an external player like God that pulls it all together, and that would still work because the guarantees for us. Um, but there is, there is, yes, there is a ravine that is bottomless. Well, the way he sees the abyss is instead the, the fact that this cut between this is these are two solid areas, and this is the, the abyss in the center, in between. This expands and turns so much that you do not, the, the relationship changes, and we do not no longer speak of a cut in between things, but we speak of a patch of existence in a sea of abyss, in a sea of void. If the thing is completely turned around, this is, at least to me, is, is the way I hear it. Yeah, and so I think it's very, very important because in this case, then you have the interior you spoke about. Um, something is only interior within an outside. If, um, to, to have an outside, you need to step out of that space, that interior, and point it, namely describe it, but by stepping out, you only expand it. And, um, so there's no stepping out. There is no stepping out. The, and, but in a certain way, to me, this is ultimately the critique that one can make of Heidegger, to Heidegger, sorry, because um, he is trying to name a relationship with being that would not be naming being because naming is covering up, but he just comes up with a new name. Mm -hmm. and that's why but don't go there yet. It's just, mm. did you get the, did everybody kind of sort of hear this problem of interiority that you can't step outside of? This is where we're going with this. This is why it's so important to get this. Because the question of identity for Heidegger requires that you get that the identity is the interiority, basically. But the interiority is itself constituted or assembled um, by this relation, except it's not really a relation, it's kind of uh, the belonging. But on the other hand, it is a relation because otherwise it would collapse onto itself. As long as you understand relation is not a bridge, I mean, you can start off visually thinking of it as bridge, but then you can't continue with it that way. Yes, I could say. Can you say it loud? Well, I thought you were saying with like uh, Parmenides, the sameness there was this referring to a relation. It wasn't the bridge kind of one. So. Yes, that's exactly right. It's so, so, so the point here is that. Um, in one respect, when we're looking at the question of identity, who am I, that level of identity, um, or you know, what is the world, or you know, uh, or whatever, you know, what is this coffee? It doesn't have to be you know, so esoteric, and, you know. That the, 
but the answer begins to be sh to show itself, as it were, by um, realizing that there is an assemblage of relations that go on, and therefore there are intensities, as Barnaby mentioned, but they're not gaps. Not, they're certainly not gaps at the level of you know these excluded middle or these things that you could fall, ravines that you could fall into. Because the thing that he's going to start developing is then how does one understand, A, the gap, the, the, the things that people are thinking are gaps, or they're not exactly gaps, they're just not, they're, they're this groundless things, the groundless grounds. And at the same time, the groundless ground allows one to not step outside in the far away outside detached sense, but as another form of a surface. So what's going to, what we're going to discuss next week is the way in which difference is both interior and, let's say, um, I don't really want to say exterior, but other or elsewhere to the, to the interior. Is that, uh, is that resounding for your? Yeah, uh, I think that the difference, the, the word that I, the concept that I would link more directly to difference is heterogeneity. Heterogeneity, yes. Um, uh, something that is not commensurable, therefore not reconcilable. As long as you don't think of identity as homogeneous. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Identity is all the complexity that we know. Yes. Further to it. Further to that complexity, yes. There is this other thing which is totally in the indeterminacy. And as such, it cannot be measured against anything, nor identity can be measured against it. That's mm -hmm. quite important. Um, and yet, it plays. Because it's, it's a push to constantly read this order. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you want to say anything to this? Mm. <coughs> Volume there, that, uh, yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I wanted to pick on you. Um, I'm not, not. I'm wondering what's wrong with it. What's wrong with this idea of his art? He's not known to be a champion of the avant-garde. He's not like a door who writes huge books about the music and stuff. He's very limited to what he actually engages. Um, and I'm just not sure. I'm, I'm going back through doubt again. I'm with Martin, but now I'm nursing back out of it again and thinking mm. there's something not right about it. Mm. The, the fact that it requires a clearing, it doesn't seem to be. There, 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 you know, there are limits. Uh, the fact that it always sets itself up against anxiety. I love the way that you know he, he takes um, Heidegger's uh, being a nothingness and kind of humanizes it. Makes who who it, takes it? Um, uh, Martin uh, Heidegger, when he takes um, Hegel's being. Oh, Hegel, a, yeah, okay, yeah, right. sorry, yeah. Takes Hegel being a nothingness. And, is like a, an intellectual exercise in Hegel, you know, so it's, it's logic, there's no temporality to it, it's a being, that's nothing, that's kind of the same thing, because there's no determination either, but one's indirect, the other's direct, there is a difference, and therefore you have becoming always kind of interesting. And then the way that um, Heidegger then says, well look, you're being a nothing, and he's sort of that in anxiety makes it, you know, puts him in thinking, feeling, it's humanizing us. I love it when he does all that kind of thing, but at the same time, there's always a question that he neither said, something not quite right about this. There's something, I love reading Heidegger, but there's something, when you say it, when you were saying that there's something that doesn't, do, it doesn't fit with my art, how, mm -hmm. how I practice it in, a, in, a, in mm -hmm. any kind of way. Um, you mean the, the examples I was... With, uh, with, uh, just listening to you, you know, mm -hmm. you do brilliantly it's explanation, but there's just something nagging in the back of my mind mm -hmm. that somehow um, in my art, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's much more messy, and I don't find this as messy, uh, because I, I work with frag, still work within the conceptual broken, broken fragments of, uh, of identity, rather than leaping out of identity, mm -hmm. still more free, it? and also without leaping out of historical as well, working within a historical, because he can at any time, and I know that you said in the non philosophical examples, he's always going back to wing mills and this kind of mm -hmm. thing, yet at the same time he says, nuclear power, there it is, it's all that should be enough in the world, nuclear power but for the being a being. So at the same time you can kind of leap out of the, the historiographical 
with this move. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is something that you read, you read in other criticism and mm -hmm. then slightly go over it. Now, because he's really too personal, I think there's the world historicality mm -hmm. that he gets out of. And my art, I think, is more, you know, another way of looking at it to say is, is going to be much more a kind of messy um, uh, working within identity and stuff within the language that he wants to leap out of. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just doubting because that's 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 good because that means I will then go away and you know <laughs> engage in the in the in the cover of the, the um, criticism and tags or not tags but some of the some of the thoughts I about around this that to um, that aren't going to go with him in, in this book. Mm. I don't, you know, I think that's all very great, and brilliant. And I want to study that as well, but at the same time, I want to know about the the people who are going. Yes, I just think about the interiority as well, which is very code guardian. Mm -hmm. the philosophy of the interior and that whole kind of idea of the internal re uh, re recollection of world and stuff. And I'm just not sure. I, I want to go away and look more at why people think, you know, that there's, 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 some, there's some kind of uh, other, other issues that should really be... No, I appreciate very, very, very much what you're saying. And I think in the first place when I, uh, I embrace what I read, I sort of like the capital, the champion, I get for today, and then the next time, right, if I would read something else, I do with the same enthusiasm. Um, I don't, don't see why, if I would still to defend the side of the for today, why um, one couldn't have fragmented identities playing in the relational correspondence. I mean, one can have it, can have uh, almost a fractal chain of of um, of players, indeed, where something that looks solid that, that it is not and then also its components are not and all that plays in the distribution has major lumps, smaller parts um, simultaneously. So one has a big piece, the old uh, Britain as a whole plays over our interpretation today and reading it. And then our individual histories and presences and our individual understanding of English and of the translation to some of us are foreign or entire foreign and more things, and then what are the translation here. So there are all these uh, differences in scale of, of this relationship that all play at the same time. It's not yeah. only um, the text and the interpretation, or the text and the philosophy, or whatever. It's, there is much, it's far more complex, because many, many things happen contemporarily, simultaneously. You know. So why not? There could be also a practice of identity that's still play. Yeah, it's this making of art. Like, like the way that, you know, when they say that when Heidegger would come along, you know, he was, he, was, he was seen in Germany as a continuation of Hegel. Well, that's an interesting question, in what way? Or the way that he's taken in America at the minute and it's like, well, can be taken as a kind of a pragmatist and they take the, the, the tool mm -hmm. understanding. Um, so there's different ways to understand the Heidegger in, in the contemporary philosophical uh, as you found with the Dreyfus. Um, so I'm just curious about some of the other questions that this raises, you know, just mm -hmm. because because everything's going swimmingly and uh, it's, it's uh, a little bit of um, turbulence in the water. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Do I? Do you want to say So well, next week, uh, what we'll look at in the question of difference is perdurance. This is, this is something that, just try and remember that word. The stand-in of nothingness. Was What's that? The stand-in of nothingness, I think you find that he calls it in our density of difference. Is it a specific part or is it a P-E-R-D-U-R-A-N-C-E, perdurance. P-E-R-D-U-R. A N C E. Thank you. It's in identity and difference. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's but you have to read them some sort of read them together. The other thing is is that I know it's very difficult to read this work, but like I was saying at the outset, um, if you allow yourself just to read it 
slowly, quickly, however you can read it, but just read it, and read it at least three times. That just before you want to say anything about it. Allow yourself to, um, to, to think that, okay, what is this guy trying to say? Or what is trying to be said here? What, what's the point? Um, because I think that one will get past the, uh, oh, we're dealing with Heidegger or whatever, I mean, that kind of thing, so you can get a sense of how does it, what, whatever it takes for you to have that hook that gets you to start able, being able to open it up and go, okay, that, I can see what's happening here. Even if you have to play around with apples and, and, and walnuts, you know, in order to make your point so that it makes clear. So having said that, I just want to say um, the egg that we've been passing around, yes, that very egg, uh, filled with the uh, little dot, little bee beings, um, would you say that that is the relationship between Dasein and being, and little bee being, the egg being Dasein, um, or would you say the passing around of the egg was the Dasein, and the egg was the little bee being? Or would you say it's nothing to do with any of that? Passing around is probably the closest thing to do. It requires uh, action. Um, it does create, or at least, some sort of pattern of the weather. The way we use it, the way we use it, the way we use it, the way we The object itself, the egg, is the most dangerous thing of it, because it implies origin. <laughs> it is exactly what they say is not happening. Um, yeah, so passing around is the closest thing. I'm, not not he, but close. I mean, um, and, and the reason I'm more do you have a well, I was thinking this, it, it kind of aims to create a, sort of a kind of perfect repetition in its sort of opportunity in terms of like, really, I feel like I'm supposed to go up to my hand there. And it doesn't really like invite passing around as an object, it doesn't facilitate passing around. So it becomes a different thing entirely when that starts to happen. But, Peter, personally, you hold your hand out and it gives you the nuts. Mm -hmm. So there is an element of this opening up rather than taking, which has been described here. I mean, I, the only reason I'm mentioning it, first of all, is for you to think about how things have relations that aren't literally outside of each other. And also how a relation can be established <coughs> when it itself is an interior relation. Just to start playing, just get your, like, exercising with your mind, as though you're doing, you know, um, leg lifts or something. How you can see how relations get established within, without, how the move, how movement gets, is starting to happen here. We still may end up with what Mark was saying, was that it has nothing to do with nothing. But I have a feeling that you might be able to see it slightly differently once you get the hang of how that, how this is working. Okay, so next week, uh, Bernadette, uh, Bernadette's coming, uh, we're gonna do difference, um, Barnaby, you're going to be part of this insanity? Yes, yeah, okay. absolutely. From the wine chateau. From the wine chateau, yes, really, honestly. Um, and there's also, I think there's something that's happening. Grace, Grace couldn't be here today because she's setting up a, um, a big show. What, do you know what that's about, that show? Are you in it as well? No. But it's no, in, where is it? It's in the Midlands. Uh, it's in the Midlands. Uh, what's it called? Midlands. Uh, the Tarko, right, yeah. Oh, where is that? Is it the muck? By the park? Yeah, that's right. Where, do, where is that? Just Cannock Hill Park or Cannock Hill? Cannock Hill Park. Okay, yeah. so when is that? Do you know when the opening is? Mm. 
Thursday. Thursday, okay. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, Etienne Bellevar is speaking in London uh, on Thursday, uh, the 31st, is it? I said, I think. The 30th. The 30th. Of March. Is it March or February? Uh, we don't no. see anything. Oh, Since okay. February doesn't have the 30th, the so of March is Friday. Okay, right, must be the day, yeah. So um, I'll send around the uh, information. They don't, they're not allowing reservations, um, so it'll be a first come first serve thing, unfortunately. Um, and he is speaking about exteriority and interiority. Um, and in fact, he's speaking about Foucault's relationship to Blanchot and the notion of the outside. Nothing like being on top of things. Well, that was a book that was written in 1969, but anyway, whatever. Uh, but I still think it's Etienne Valley Bar. If you have a chance, you should go hear him. So, and since it's not on the on Tuesday, it's on Thursday. Where is it? In London. Oh, it's in. Uh, I'll send the things around on the on the list. Uh, but it's um, it's part of the um, Daniel. Uh, let me know. Daniel is very upset that he's missing our meetings, but he has to teach all day on Tuesdays. It changes his thing. That's really why he's not here. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that on March eighth, we're going to have the uh, second aspect of the photography workshop that was, you know, the what is a photograph. It'll be happening in London. Uh, and, um, well, you're all A, invited, and B, I'll just watch the space because we'll be sending around information on that. Okay? Yay. Good. We'll talk. Good. Okay. Donovan, you have anything to say? Final words? No, that, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. See you all. Bye. 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 Yes. I'm booking for um, breaks. Can I just leave it off on the shelf and then? Uh, just leave it there on the book on the thing. A little note, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. See you, Barnaby. Mm -hmm. See you. Thanks for inviting me, Johnny. Yeah, more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um, it was, the the sound was not brilliant. Um, certain people I couldn't hear at all. Uh, Mark and Lon difficult to hear, but you I could hear very clearly at about three quarters of what Matthias was saying. Um, and so I was able to kind of patch uh, it together in certain places. Okay, good. Better, awesome. better, than, better than, um, than not being here. Not being here, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I'll be, I'll be doing the same next week. Good. All right, good. So see, see, see you next week. Ooh. Yeah, thanks, okay. Johnny. See you. Bye. Bye. Look at some people going to the place. Oh, <laughs> going to the pub. Mm -hmm. You're going to which pub? The drink stuff. Uh, the Ah, excellent. Uh, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, had that, I had that book, the Bremen and Frederick Lectures, and I have either left it in London or left it somewhere every time I come here. It, it's just phenomenal to me. <laughs> but anyway, I just want to mention that painful moment. Thank you. Don't give up. I'm used to being wrong. Good, good. It's, it's more part of that. Um, just allow yourself to. Yeah, I'll just I'll try and read it. Just read it myself. I'm not yeah. used to doing it like that either. Going to listen to other people first. So I'll try it like that. Yeah, see what, see what it says yeah. to you. <laughs> and then you might see that. Yeah. Yeah. And next, see, um, he said that there might be a, a go for funding perhaps.